the universe is inside our heads, our head is outside the universe. Support for SyncBook Radio comes from listeners like you. Consider helping to make independent productions like SyncBook Radio possible by becoming a donor. Your generous gift helps to keep these unique voices broadcasting and exploring. Details about how you can help can be found at thesyncbook.com slash donate. Thanks. People hear the word physics and think it's not for them. And scientists hear the words metaphysics and think it's not for them. People seem to be puzzled as to how you could have integrated these two things. They, they in our culture, are very, very separate. The physics and the metaphysics, the philosophy and the science, are very separate. A long time back, they weren't so separate. A long time back, they were, they were really seen as all one thing, just different aspects, different ways of looking at the world, which indeed they are. That's why you get a PhD in physics, and that's a doctor of philosophy, because everything was seen as philosophy. There was natural philosophy, which then we later called science, and there were maybe different kinds of philosophy, but it was all philosophy. And philosophy was really a, a way of, of reasoning out how the world works. You are listening to Always Record from SyncBook Radio and TheSyncBook.com. Always Record is a series of long-form roundtable conversations. Today, for episode 98 of Always Record, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Tom Campbell, the author of My Big Toe. Yeah, so Tom, thanks for being with us today. It's like been a long time coming, and sorry it took uh, a little time here to get this set up, but we're, we're really pleased to have you on, honored to have you on. We're followers of your work, and um, I guess maybe just starting out, maybe you can just introduce yourself, and then we'll kind of just go from there, if that's cool. Introduce myself? Yes, sir. Any, any, anything you think is appropriate. I mean, how, who, if you don't mind, I'd like where to... Do you, who are you? Where do you come from? Yeah. Or and to I, Helen, go ahead. And I'd like, if you would be able to, I'd actually like you to phrase that in the sense of give us a little idea of who you are, but also if you have any uh, scientific background or if this was more of a, if your big toe sort of came from a more of a revelatory method, if you kind of touch on that in there as well, I'd appreciate that. Okay. I'm Tom Campbell. I'm a physicist. And I wrote the books, the trilogy of books called My Big Toe. Um, the first... You know, there, there are uh, three books which come in separate, uh, separate cuppers or they come in all, in, all in one. Uh, Awakening, Discovery, and Inner Workings are the name of the three books. And uh, as a physicist, I, uh, of course, got a bachelor's degree, then a master's degree, and then worked on my PhD degree, passed all my tests, did my research uh, for my thesis, uh, wrote a thesis, and then I left... Uh, academia before actually uh, getting my PhD degree. So I have a PhD education, but I do not hold a PhD degree, if, if that is of any interest to anyone. Uh, anyway, uh, the books were written over about a five-year period, and they are at least uh, as much physics as they are metaphysics and philosophy. Uh, as a physicist, I uh, model reality. That's what physics. That's what physicists do. They produce models of reality. And because about the same time I started my working life, my career in the early 1970s, I also started around that same time working uh, with Bob Monroe in a laboratory for the study of consciousness. So I've got about the same number of years in both fields, and and uh, have. I should say pretty closely probably put in almost the same amount of time into both fields, although probably put a little more into the physics uh, than, the, uh, than the consciousness. But in any case, um, when I started writing these books, the idea was to create a, an understanding of our reality and of consciousness. 
consciousness being fundamental to our reality. So, so I, I started with the consciousness and then eventually uh, worked in the, uh, uh, the physics. So you'll find the books are mostly slanted to the consciousness um, uh, philosophy metaphysics because I thought that would be uh, easier for most people to understand and that's the way you can get your, your best grip on the larger consciousness system. For those that also are interested in science and the physics, uh, uh, toward the end, I do get in, into some of that too. I don't hit that too hard because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, targeting this to a general lay audience, not to scientists. Now, if you want more of the science, you can go to my videos, which I have about 220 on YouTube, and um, Calgary Workshop would be a good one, and there you'll get the physics, um, you know, several hours of that in that video if you want that. But again, I'm trying to keep it at a, at a level that most people can understand, but you'll get, the, uh, you'll get the idea of the physics. So what I ended up with was what I call a big toe, and the reason that is a big toe Big toe is because it describes all of reality, not just the physical part. A little toe, now T O E is an acronym for theory of everything. A little toe, uh, like the one Einstein worked on for uh, the last two thirds of his uh, career in, in physics, uh, is, is uh, focused on just physical reality. Just just uh, really uniting quantum mechanics with relativity was the, was the key. The idea being that neither one seemed fundamental because both only worked in one kind of region. Uh, did, you, did you notice it? And the physics, and the physics uh, let's say, for doing quantum mechanics is a little different than the way we do relativity or, or mechanics. So they seemed like they were subsets of something bigger. So Einstein and other physicists wanted to get the overarching understanding that would, would allow them then to derive all of physics, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity among all the rest of it. They have failed so far to do that. Now mine is a big toe because it not only accomplishes the little toe, it does derive quantum mechanics and relativity, um, but it also is a model of consciousness. So it's a theory of consciousness as well as a theory of physics. And it turns out that, that uh, physics uh, and our physical reality, biology, chemistry, all of the sciences, uh, all the hard sciences are uh, derivatives or if you say, if we might say subsets of this larger big picture of reality that uh, is fundamentally derived from consciousness. And the hard sciences are, are basically that part of that picture dealing where, with items or, or things, if you like, where the uncertainty is small and it's a, it's a subset. So my big toe is indeed a, a theory of everything, everything including the subjective as well as the objective, including you know, what shall I say, uh, you know, metaphysics, including the paranormal as well as the normal. In, in my big toe, there really is only normal. Uh, the paranormal is just normal. It's a, just a, it comes right out of the, of the theory just like physics does. So it's not really para anything. It's just they're all normal. It's just different uh, uh, parts of the same overall understanding. So that's kind of who I am and what it is I've done and I guess what uh, kind of brings us all together here to discuss that is this, uh, this book, My Big Toe, and the, and the hundreds of, uh, uh, of videos that also uh, talk a lot about applications because My Big Toe is not just about making a theory of everything and deriving physics, but once you understand how reality works, then you also understand what your purpose is, why we're here, what's, you know, kind of what's going on and, and uh, what should we be doing with it? How do we fit into this bigger picture? What's our purpose? And with that, you can understand what, um, you know, how, why your life is the way it is. You know, if you happen to be in a life where th you're struggling all the time and uh, it's tough and, and uh, you have a difficult time, then you can realize why that is and change it. Um, 
So it, it has its applications to everyday life and everyday existence uh, very fundamentally in the way we interact with each other other and, and the way we even interact with ourselves. So it's a very fundamental thing that uh, talks about uh, subjective as well as objective reality and our place in it and how it is we can um, modify ourselves, I guess, to, uh, to go along with the purpose of this thing we're a part of. And when we do that, life is is sweet. Things work out. Uh, there's there's joy instead of frustration. So that's it in a you know what uh, three hundred words or less uh, encapsulation. And that was I think that was a pretty nice encapsulation. Um, would you say it's fair if we're trying to boil that down even a little bit further? I mean, I really encourage everyone to to look at your videos and to uh, if they if they find that's a bit intimidating to start with a three volume set of books to at least look through some of your videos because you do an excellent job of kind of making this really accessible. Uh, would you say, would you say it's safe to say to boil it down to its essence? Would you describe your big theory of everything as essentially being that the universe is a simulation of sorts? Yes, that's, uh, that's certainly a part of it. Uh, when you want to, or when you get to describing just this physical reality that we call our physical universe. And in my theory, that's just one small part of a much bigger thing. For most people and most scientists, that's the whole thing. That's really all there is. That's, that's the biggest of all big things is our physical universe. In my theory, that's just a, a subset, one of many subsets and not even a very big part of the whole. But in any case, yes, when we describe our physical universe, it's best described as a virtual reality. That means a computed reality. Um, maybe uh, another way to say it would be uh, um, a simulation. Okay? Now, the way that works is very much the way simulations work everywhere. So if you've played The Sims or World of Warcraft or any other of the dozen uh, role-playing games that are multiplayer simulations of virtual realities, then you know that you are the consciousness of your player. Okay, you hold the mouse and the joystick and the keyboard, you control those, and the player, say your elf in World of Warcraft, your player only takes action, only does things as you tell it to do things, you the consciousness, and it the avatar, the body, if you will, in a virtual reality. Well, that's the way virtual realities work. That's the way they have to work. The elf cannot be in the same reality as you, the consciousness. See, the elf cannot, can never be aware of the server. The server that creates the elf has to be in a different reality than the elf. And that's because of the, the, the logic that a simulation cannot create itself. A simulation or a virtual reality has to be created by some, you know, and exist in a place other than the simulation that it creates. Now, that's pretty simple logic that, uh, you know, simulation doesn't create itself. It has to be created in other, as Fred can call it. In any, in any case, we are the same way, and that's a fundamental nature of virtual reality. We come into, I guess, we may be in two different things to most people. We, the body that uh, we identify ourselves with, that's the avatar. And then there's we, the consciousness, which is in a different reality. And if we call we, the body, being in a physical reality, then we, the consciousness, are in a non-physical reality. Elf feels the same way. The elf feels like he is in the physical reality of the world of Warcraft. All the buildings, mountains, rivers, rivers lakes, and everything else, all the other people in world of Warcraft, Warcraft make up a physical reality to the elf and the server and the consciousness, you the player, are in a non-physical reality according to that elf. You see, his physical universe is the world generated by the server uh, owned by World of Warcraft. So here we are the same thing. We are consciousness. Fundamentally, we are consciousness and we are playing an avatar in this virtual reality that is our body. 
And the virtual reality computes like a simulation how these avatars interact. It's a multiplayer game, and they compute what the what the avatar can do and can't do basically by a rule set. The rule set sets the constraints. World of Warcraft works the same way. They have a rule set, and their rule set, um, you know, you cannot walk through uh, trees. You have to open doors to go, you know, inside. You have a certain amount of force and, and ability to interact. If you fall off a high cliff, you get hurt or you die if it's high enough. So it has rule sets too. Um, characters uh, like the elf can't just flap his arms and fly away. That doesn't uh, go along with the rule set. Now they pick their rule set uh, in uh, World of Warcraft to look, look sort of like our rule set so we would be accustomed to the way things work there. But in any case, it could be anyway. If, we, if they wanted the elf to be able to flap his arms and fly, they could certainly do that too. But it would be a different rule set. They just have to change the rules. Well, that's the way it is with our virtual reality. Um, the, the, the avatar and the virtual reality's job is to set the constraints on the data stream to the player, to the consciousness. Now, think about World of Warcraft. It's, you know, it goes on inside its own world. It's a computed virtual reality, but it sends a data stream to each player. And that data stream gets to your computer and then your video card and sound card and the rest of it renders it on your screen in terms of pixels. Okay, And that's your vision of the world. But every user, every player has his own personal data stream. And if you look to the right, then you s data is sent to you at your computer to show you what's at the right. If you look up, data is sent to you to show you what's up. And when you look up, or let's say now you look to the left and data is sent to you to see what's left, no data is being sent to you for what's right. So you only get the data that your senses would be sensing. So the elf's eyes is sensing you know, where he looks. Looks to the right or left, and you get the data that would be his sense data that works the same way here. Every player, every being, every conscious entity, and it's not just people we're talking about, but every conscious entity uh, works the same way. It has its own data stream in a multiplayer game. And if, if you, you know, close your eyes, then no visual data is sent in your data stream. If you open them, then visual data is sent in your data stream. Now, what happens in the world of Warcraft when there are no players? Let's say for some reason there's not a single person logged in as a player to World of Warcraft. Is the wor World of Warcraft uh, server still generating lakes and rivers and trees and you know uh, NPC characters and buildings? Is it just you know flying away generating all these things? Of course not. That stuff doesn't exist on its own for its own purpose. That stuff is generated only when there's a data stream that needs data. So if one person then logs into the game. The server starts generating a data stream to that one person. If 100,000 people get into the game from all over the planet, the server sends 100,000 independent data streams out to all those players. Our, our reality works the same way. So virtual reality, we are consciousness, we're get, getting a data stream. Okay, so you know we have sometimes people get confused and they say, well, it's a virtual reality and are you telling me that you know the the tree in the park when everybody goes to bed you know the tr tree disappears no i'm telling you when nobody's looking at that tree the tree is not rendered in anybody's data stream the tree never existed in the first place in and of itself the tr tree is only rendered in people's data streams you see i've heard so, you refer that to the double slit experiment the idea that the Double slit. It's not being rendered until we actually take the time to observe it, and therefore it has to be rendered at, in that very yes. moment. Um, this is might seem like a somewhat of a joke question, but you know the whole idea of if a tree falls in a forest. Does that sort of answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're a good straight man, uh, Alan. You're you're uh, leading me. Uh, right where I needed to go. <laughs> the, uh, it turns out that physics and physicists 
are more and more are accepting the concept that our physical reality is a virtual reality. This is not just my view- viewpoint. When I wrote these books, I published them in uh, 2002, February 2002. At that time, I only knew two or three people you know, that I could find anywhere on the planet that agreed with me that uh, reality was a virtual reality. And that was me and uh, Dr. Edward Fredkin, who was also a physicist and a uh, Oh, a fellow who's now at Cambridge, I believe, I can't remember his name. He did some work with uh, that this is a virtual reality, you know, our physical reality being a virtual reality. And it wasn't a very widely held idea. Now, I'd say maybe 20, 30 percent, all the working physicists on the planet think that this is probably a virtual reality. And every month we get that, that percent goes higher and higher. So the re- reason that's the case is that the experiments that physicists do have been telling us that this is a virtual reality. It's information-based, and that, that's the only assumption, if we assume it's a virtual reality, that really uh, describes the results of the experiment. Uh, I was listening to a, a video from uh, the people working at CERN when they were, they were uh, uh, trying to find the Higgs, and in this little little video from this little group of physicists, they were trying to explain to this person a new view of, you know, kind of the, the more current view of physics. And they said, uh, we used to think of, a, of an electron as a little piece of mass with a charge. It says, that no longer holds up. Now we think of an electron as a point with the properties of mass and charge. Now, if you're going to simulate a, a, an electron okay, in a computer, how would you simulate it? You would simulate it as a point with the properties of mass and charge. So for, for reasons like that, the, the experiments uh, are convincing physicists that the best way to describe our reality is as a virtual reality. Now, they haven't yet taken the step that, that the uh, you know, consciousness is the computer, is the server, but um, that step will, will uh, have to come later. And if anyway, you, can, can I just ask one clarifying question there? As far as the mainstream of physicists are concerned, when they say the best way to describe it is as a simulation, would you say that's more for the uh, the purposes of modeling, or how, what do you think is the percentage of people who are sort of taking that as a literal next step? Well, and, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, physicists model reality. Science models reality. Science does not say what reality is, scientists make models of reality. What that means is we take measurements, okay? We take measurements of of, of, uh, things happening, data, you know, how big is it, how how much does it weigh, Uh, these kinds of things. We take measurements and then we produce models that make the measurement make sense so that we, we can connect it to other measurements. We take measurements of all sorts of things and then we produce a model that says how all these things interact and work together. So all of the, um, what shall I say, uh, descriptions of how the world works are models. One of the problems physicists have had in the past, and many of them are aware of this now, but they're becoming more and more aware of it, is that we make the mistake of believing Believing in our models, that our models are indeed fundamental, that that is reality, rather than that they are just models. Uh, we did that with the, uh, again, with the electron. We saw the electron as this little uh, hard piece of mass with a, with a charge on it, whizzing around places. And then we realized that our experiments told us that wasn't true, that, that electron was a probability distribution, just a probability distribution. And if you go... 40 years back and look at an elementary science book, you'd see an electron as like a little BB uh, buzzing around a nucleus that was much bigger. And now if you go look at a current, well, even back 10 years, 15 years ago, if you look at a science book that's no more than 20 years old, you'll see a, a nucleus with a fuzzy gray cloud around it, which represents the electron. So we, we had a model of this little piece of mass with a charge on it. it. turned out that didn't work out so well. 
Well, we have that with, with all of our particles. You see, we measure effects of things that we can't see. We just measure the effect. So you look at an electron and you see that it has an effect that will, it will move in, a, in an electric field, therefore it has charge. Okay, it has momentum, therefore it has mass. So we then, um, we then make a model of it and say it's a little chunk of mass with a charge. Turns out that's a nice simple idea, but the real world isn't made that way. It's much more direct and accurate to say it's a probability distribution and once you measure it, once you locate it and say it's right here, then it becomes a particle. Then it acts like a particle, which takes us to the double slit experiment. So anyway, your, your question there is that all, all physics is really just models. That's, what, that's the way science works. Your, bi your biology is the same way. When we talk about little particles and cells and, and pieces of cells, we're talking about models that scientists have created in order to explain the data. But we have to realize they're just mo models. Don't believe in them as, as, as uh, the actual reality itself. That's a, that's a way scientists confuse themselves. Anyway, uh, one of the first experiments that, that told scientists this, the very first one that was, the big, was a big eye-opener, was called the double slit experiment. And in the double slit experiment, they they did two different experiments. One, they shone a light on a, two slits, which is basically a barrier with, with two uh, slits open so the light could go through it. And they'd been doing this for many, many years back in the 18, 1800s. And what happens is you get a diffraction pattern. And that was well understood as a wave property because some of the light would go through uh, slit A, some of the light would go through slit B, and the light waves <clears throat> going and through A and B would interfere with each other and you'd get an interference pattern or a diffraction pattern on a screen behind the slits. So way, uh, light was a wave that was clear. Then in the early 19, or late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, we found out that light also carried little chunks of momentum, just like the electrons did. So uh, light was a particle because you could see discrete chunks of momentum displayed every time you got a photon, which was a new word in our vocabulary then, uh, hit, hit a detector. So now light was a particle. Well, if light was a particle, how did light work as a wave? That was the big question. So we arranged to have a particle one at a time because we thought that the, the beam of light was just billions and billions of particles. And why those particles should array themselves in a, in a diffraction pattern wasn't uh, very clear. So they found a way to throw one particle, shoot one particle at a time at these two slits. The idea being that surely the particle would either go through one slit or the other slit and it would therefore land on the screen right behind the slit. So we expected two, two piles of uh, electrons, if you will, uh, or photons this was in the beginning two piles of photons, one that would pile up behind one slit and one that would pile up behind the other slit because that's the way particles work. They travel in a straight line unless acted on by an exterior force. That's Newton's second law. So that's what they expected to see. They shot the single particles at it one at a time and big surprise, they still got the diffraction pattern. Now how can single particles diffract and create a diffraction pattern? when they're this, these little chunks of mass. Well, that was a big problem. So they said, well, there's something going on that's funny there at the slits. Let's take a look. So they put detectors at the slits. Then they fired the uh, photons one at a time. And sometimes they'd go through slit A, a and the detector would say, bleep, got a, got a photon here. And sometimes they'd go through slit B, and uh, that would register a photon. And whenever they measured the photon going through the slit, Whenever they did that experiment, they got the two piles of photons, one behind each slit. In other words, once they measured them at the slit, they acted like a particle. They traveled in a straight line and hit the screen, just like a particle should. So then they came to the uh, understanding that light is sometimes a wave and sometimes a particle. And it's a wave if you don't measure it at the slit and you basically don't know where the particles are. And it's a particle 
if you measure the particle as it goes through the slit. Well, that was kind of an amazing thing. Then they did something even stranger than that. They did an erasure. It's called a delayed erasure, erasure experiment. Now imagine the, the uh, par particles going through the slit. They're being measured. Okay, We say you know, there's a little detector at each slit. Every time a photon goes through, uh, we, we count it at the slit. We know it's there. All right, now we're going to do that, and then we're going to collect the data at the screen. Now, we've already done this experiment a bunch of times, and we know the result is that a pile of electrons will pile up behind each, or photons, I keep saying electrons. The same experiment can be done with electrons, hydrogen atoms, buckyballs, anything. Um, you know, it, the size of the particle isn't that important, except in the way the experiment uh, has to be done. Theoretically, uh, any size works. So, uh, what we have now is we're sending photons through. We've done that experiment. We know a pile should pile up behind each slit. We've collected the data at each slit. But we don't look at the screen yet. We just have that data, and uh, we expect that that's the way it's going to be. So, it's all done. Experiment's over. All the data's been counted at the slits. It's all on a screen somewhere. And now, sometime later, and it wouldn't make a difference whether this was a second later or ten years later, we... We have not looked at the slit data, we have not looked at the screen data, and we erase the slit data. That's the data of, of which, which particles went through uh, which slit. We just erase it. Now, there is no data in this reality frame telling us about whether or not a particle went through slit A or slit B. None. It's gone. So, what do you expect we'll get when we look at the screen? Everyone thought what they would get when they looked at the screen was two piles of particles, one behind each slit, because after all, that had all been collected long before we did the erasure. But what they got was a diffraction pattern. Without the data from the slits, it reverted to the default case, if you will, where there's no detectors at all of a diffraction pattern, because having no, no data equates to you know, never having detected it. It's got the same result. There is no data here. Whether there were no detectors or whether you detected it and erased it, you end up in the same situation with no information about the individual particles. Therefore, you get a diffraction pattern. Now, that experiment says very clearly that particles are probability distributions, that you have a probability of going through certain slits, and the probability of going through, you know, the other slit, uh, and those probabilities combine and produce a result at the screen, something that is probable at the screen. So, if, if you don't have the information, whether you didn't take it or whether you took it and erased it, you're going to get a diffraction pattern, all right? So, what that means is not that the data was collected and it was two piles of data at the screen when we did this experiment with the detectors. So we had these two piles, and then we erased it, and suddenly those two piles went away and changed themselves into a diffraction pattern. That did not happen. The point is, nobody had looked at that screen yet. So what was on that screen had not been rendered yet in anybody's data stream. Remember, reality is just individual rendering into individual data stream. Nobody had looked. So what was on that screen was an indeterminate. It hadn't happened yet. It was just a possibility with a probability. And after the data got erased, it changed the probability. You see? So when we did look at that screen later after the erasure, the probabilities were different as to what would be there. Okay? So we get the diffraction pattern because that's the default pattern when there is no information. So that's what we get. So it's not that we had two piles of particles and that changed magically to, a, to a, uh, an array of particles and a diffraction pattern. It's that there was nothing on the screen at all, nothing defined there until we look at it. And when we look at it, a random draw is taken from the probability distribution of the possibilities and out comes an answer. Well, in this case, because there was no 
data with probability of one that it was going to be a diffraction pattern. So that's what we got when we looked. Nothing was changed. It didn't change from one, one uh, bunch of particles, uh, you know, one uh, distri distribution of particles to another. It just was that data stream isn't computed until somebody looks at it. So then we had all of these ideas floating around. It was called in physics for a long time the measurement problem. The problem is that, you know, the measurement is what, you know, collapses the wave function. And then when we did the erasure experiment, we realized it's not the measurement at all because we made the measurement. We just erased the data. And it was also, it was called the consciousness problem that uh, it was a consciousness because if there was wasn't anybody there to look at the data or to, you know, to see the data. If the data was erased and nobody saw it, then it changed the answer. So consciousness was collapsing the wave function, and that's not it either. either. Though it takes a consciousness to make a measurement, and it takes a consciousness to look at the data, to look at the information. The key thing is that this reality is a virtual reality. It's based on information. If the information is here about what's called the which way data, in other words, which way did the particle go through the slit, slit A or slit B, which way did it go? It's called which way data. If we have that data here, then we have information in this reality about particles because we measured the particle at the slit. So now we have a particle. Somebody measured it. There's a particle in our data stream on our collection measurement equipment. And when that happens, then the result, the probability of what we get on the end has to be a particle because that's the rule. Particles travel in a straight line and, you know, unless they're acted on by some outside force. So that's what we get. If we don't measure the particle, then the particle remains in its natural state, which is a probability, a probability distribution. Because we don't know where it is. So there's some probability distribution that it could be here or here or here. And all those places have a certain probability that that's where it is. So we have this positional probability distribution. It, it stays that way because no measurements are made. So nobody has to get a data stream that has any data in it. There's no, no data produced in this reality. That probability interacts with itself because some of the prob there's some probability probability will go through this slit and some probability will go through the other slit and then that probability interacts and produces a diffraction pattern where that diffraction pattern is really a probability pattern. It says the prob probability is you know this value at this point and it's that value at that point and some of the points have you know non-zero values and there's zero values in between and that makes a diffraction pattern. So that's how it works. That was Those experiments were done in the 1920s, early in the well, actually, they were done in the early 1900s, 1915 through 1918. And at that time, the physicists were really excited about it because obviously it was telling us that reality wasn't anything at all like we thought it was. But they had no idea how to make a model to describe reality as probability. It just didn't <coughs> seem to sit well with them because they had this belief that reality was a physical matter kind of thing. They were all, all materialists at the core because that's the way it was with Newton, which came before quantum mechanics. So we had scientists uh, very uh, much uh, believers in materialism. Suddenly we have experiments showing that these are not material particles. They're probability distributions. Niels Bohr. Or came up with an alternate description of them just in terms of probability and statistics. But the physicists you know, kind of outvoted him and said, no, yeah, we could do that, that works, but we want them to be particles. So they called them particles, but they added a modifier in front of the word particle, which then allowed them to be actually not particles at all, but still call them particles. And then we called them quantum particles. Oh, these aren't classical particles, which is what we think of as little chunks of mass. And these are quantum particles. And they don't really say quantum particle is a probability distribution because it feels better, sounds better, if you just call them particles, quantum particles. So it made the materialists feel better to do that. So we have all of these little particles now. We have uh, 61, I think, fundamental particles and something like 19 arbitrary constants that go with them to describe the physical world. All of these particles are simply models. We 
saw uh, uh, results of experiments. We saw little bubbles in a bubble chamber, and we saw how those bubbles curled in a, in a magnetic field. So we make models of what could do that. And these particles are simply models. Um, they're not really fundamental particles either. You know, uh, we think they are, but when we get enough energy to break them apart, we'll find and more things inside because we've got a long way to go before we hit the limits of resolution in the virtual reality. Uh, uh, Tom, even the concept of a fun. Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, just uh, not not to cut you off or anything, but um, well, that's all right. I've been talking a long time. I need <laughs> to be cut off, so jump, jump right in. Okay, so you know, I I love I love theory, and I could honest, I could even uh, I see so many parallels between your work and say David Bohm who is one of my scientific idols and his information potential and his was more a, a field view of information versus say the granulated or um, digital view that maybe you hold or other uh, uh, other proponents of that view hold but it's that I see that as qualitative and not um, necessarily they're not opposed to one another but also there's this practice side of it that you you brought up very early and that I want to bring it back to real quick because I think a lot of people in the synchronicity community are very much engaged with practice and trying to find you know what synchronicity in their lives where is it or even if not in their lives how is it manifesting in culture and pop media and those kind of things and in a similar way um, that's how they explore reality and you began to explore reality back in the 70s through your practice which was like yoga Right. So, how did you get into that, and how did that open up your view as to what this reality is? Because, in one sense, you could arrive at it from a purely academic like reading it in books, but then it comes down to, well, how do you separate all these? Because they're all very logical and whatnot. So, unless you're having a tangible experience, uh, you can't really differentiate some of these models. You know, how uh, you can't prove a multiverse. How are you going to prove to me a multiverse unless you've touched or experienced it? And right. so. So in your in your case, you know you you've gone you you've explored those other dimensions, that inner space as well as the outer space, and you found a compatibility between them. So it's not just all theory crafting. There's a practice to what you do, and I'd like to get into that a little more, like these ideas of astral projection, and how do we know that's real versus in our minds? Because again, like, are you bringing back valuable information? And like shamans did or continue to do and so on do you see the parallels between those and so maybe just to dig into that a little bit and then i'm sure guillaume might have a question or two um after that so sure. uh, anyway if you want to take that well, however you okay, want okay yeah sure i like i say i started both of these these two uh careers in the study of consciousness and uh and study of physics pretty much the same at the same time and it, I was with Bob Monroe in his in his laboratory, and he very quickly caught us how, taught us how to go out of body on demand whenever we wanted to. We could put ourselves in the proper state and uh, get into a out of body uh, mind frame. Now, what that means, we call it out of body. You know, out of body is a very very poor name for this. Basically, what it is is your your consciousness, as we as we said earlier is not part of the same reality frame as your avatar, as your body. So what all that it is, all this out of body is, it, it sounds like there's something in your body that comes out and that's not what's going on at all. Simply, you are consciousness and you're a, you're a player playing a, a, an avatar. So you're consciousness and you just let the, let the avatar avatar's reality go. So here you are with your mouse and your keyboard playing an elf. You let the elf go. You're no longer focused on that game. And where are you? Well, you're sitting at your computer. Well, that's a different reality frame than the one the elf lives in, you see. So now to the elf, you've, you're non-physical. So you have stepped out of the elf's frame in World of Warcraft, and now you're in the frame where you sit in your chair and have a computer and uh, the server and the comm lines and the internet and all the rest of that stuff. So you've just changed reality frames. You've just gone out of the elf's body, if you like. So that's why I say, uh, uh, you know, this out of body is a, is a poor term. All you're doing is shifting your focus and shifting your attention to a different reality frame. When you go play your elf, you shift your, 
your attention focus into the World of Warcraft frame. And that's where if you can really get into that game, game, then you are in it entirely. You are that elf and all the things going around you, uh, you don't really notice about the physical world because you're completely focused in that World of Warcraft game. Well, it, that focus then can change to where you're not focused in that game and you're focused here. It's the same thing. We're consciousness. So all you have to do is change your focus. Let your focus go from the physical virtual reality and there you are, a consciousness aware in some other focus. Not the, not the virtual reality we call our physical universe, but some other focus. That's just the nature of consciousness. Remember, consciousness is of other. It's not of the physical universe. So when you let go of the physical universe, you find yourself in other or a non-physical place, given that there's just two things, physical and non non-physical, and we call this universe physical, then everything else has to be non-physical. Um, you know, Elf, like I say, feels the same way. So that's the out-of-body. You're not really, nothing, there's nothing really coming out of your body. The consciousness does not live in your body or live in your head, and it's not created by your brain. All of that is a virtual brain and a virtual head on a virtual bo body, and it's all just computed in a computer. There's no consciousness there. That's the hard problem. How do you get the computer to compute consciousness? Well, you see, our computers in our physical reality cannot compute consciousness. That's in, a, that's, in other, that's in another reality. Anyway, so I learned to do these things. And as I learned to be able to go into these non-physical realities, realities other than the, than the virtual one we call physical, I was able to do science there just like I could do it in the virtual reality. I was able to set up experiments and uh, take data just like I could there. Now, in this case, this was all subjective. So, when you do subjective science, you have to do it with statistics. You have to do it with probability. That's how um, you know, all the soft sciences are basically subjective sciences. Psychology, sociology, uh, economics, um, you know, political science, all of these, medicine for that matter, medicine, all of these are subjective because they're dealing with people. They're not dealing with things with, with very low uncertainty. People have very high uncertainty. Systems are very complex and uh, you don't really know how the system's going to respond. So there's a lot of uncertainty to it. And those are called soft sciences just because they deal with more uncertainty than the hard sciences. If you have a rock, well, a rock's just a rock. It just sits there, and there's not a lot of uncertainty about it. You have a person, what that person will do next, and why they do it, and how consistent they are, well, there's a lot of uncertainty there. So anyway, this so the study of consciousness from inside consciousness, not from inside the virtual reality, is a soft science, and you have to deal with it in terms of probability. So you set up a condition, and here's what happens. And then you set up the condition again and see if the same thing happens. And then you change one variable and see how that changes the result, just like you would do here. So I did that. And in, after, what, about 35 years of doing that, I thought I had uh, come to some understanding of the way consciousness worked, the way the uh, larger consciousness the system functioned and how it connects with this virtual reality, why it connects with this virtual reality, and that started to produce for me a, a, a big picture of the nature of reality, which is then in the, in the uh, late 90s, I started working on that, uh, middle to late 90s, I started working on that, finished it in 2002, published it as the trilogy. So that's kind of my inside track, if you will. If had I remained just the physicist on the outside working with hard science, I would not have ever come to the conclusions and understanding that I did. Had I been just a shaman, just someone who studied the nature of the larger reality, I would never have been able to put it into logical terms and create a logical structure, a science, if you will. Science is a logical structure that uh, you know, would describe... Uh, all of reality and understand how it described quantum mechanics and how it, you know, uh, 
derived or derived, I could use the word, derived quantum mechanics and derived relativity. So it required the physicist's attitude toward what I was experiencing. So I'd have to experience it and do research on what were the variables and how did they change. So I came into it from a scientist's viewpoint. You know, first a scientist, always a scientist. That's the way I approach everything. Uh, I'm skeptical of everything unless I find data that shows me you know, to be less skeptical. And then I'm still skeptical of it if I haven't collected every bit of data possible on it. So in any case, that was my process. I had two reality frames that I could work with and do science in and, and uh, until I could understand how they connected to each other, where did they come from, and why were, were they like that. So that's kind of the, how it is that I ended up writing these books because... I'm the scientist who also had uh, carte blanche uh, entree to the non-physical world. Mostly that doesn't happen. Usually those people who have carte blanche entree to the non-physical world are entirely right-brained. They're very intuitive. They see whole big pictures, a gestalt all at once. And that's the world they live in. And they're not very good at logical process. And they can't tell anybody else what they're actually seeing and why they see it and how they're interpreting it. They just know from, from experience how to interpret things, and it's not a model that they can explain logically to anyone else. It's just, well, I see these pictures, and then I do this and that, and it's completely uh, unexplainable as to how it works. So that's typically what you get, and on the other end, typically is what you get in science is somebody who's a 100% logical process, who has very little intuition, and if intuition ever, uh, you know, tapped them on the shoulder, they'd either deny it or figured it was just good luck. So they're not uh, going to deal in that world of subjectiveness because you can't do any science, and you know, unless it's objective. So the two types of people that have half the knowledge tend to never be the same people. Tend to never mix. And I just happen to be a physicist who got involved in uh, uh, consciousness research very early in my career when I was in my 20s and spent the next 40 years trying to figure things out. So that's why I'm a little unique in this area and come from a very unique place. Uh, yes, you had uh, uh, Dr. Bon, who uh, very much was, was interested in the metaphysical and uh, didn't just push it away saying, well, that's just nonsense. He was, he was very be uh, seriously uh, uh, connected there, but he also was was very connected to the physical world, and he basically tried to make the metaphysics physical. That would be my way of saying it. Now he came mm -hmm. up with a lot of a lot of uh, good ideas. Uh, they weren't just quite right; they didn't work out entirely. But he was he was in a process of making uh, the physical explanations for. Um, uh, metaphysical, you know, uh, you know me metaphysical things had physical explanations, and that's <clears> the <throat> wrong way to go about it. It doesn't. Uh, when you try to make metaphysics described by physical processes, it really just doesn't work. It's not that way because the the, the uh, causal, you know, causal is like a vector has to go from. Co cause to effect. Cause has to precede effect. The cause and effect vector runs from consciousness to the physical world, not the other way from the physical world to consciousness. So people who try to have physical things as the cause and um, non-physical or, or metaphysical things as the result are just going about it in the opposite direction from which it actually occurs. So that kind of makes it a difficult problem to solve. Uh, Guillaume, did you did you have a question? Yeah, in fact, uh, I heard you in a, an interview saying that uh, you were able to uh, astral project with a friend and uh, even meet uh, in those different dimensions, if if we can uh, call them like, uh, so. And uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, why is it that most people uh, cannot access those planes and uh, how are they useful to the understanding? Well, most people cannot access those planes, and I, you know, most people, I guess that's a fair, 
their thing, but there's millions of people who do access those planes, and there's probably another a bunch of millions of pe people who access those planes and aren't aware of it. Um, this what we call out of body is not re really uh, just to those people, uh, those few, but but people, many people, do quote out of body end quote uh, when they dream, they have out of body experiences and they call it dreams. Uh, other people have out-of-body experiences that they have no idea how to have them. They just have spontaneously happen sometimes. And then there's much fewer people who have, have them uh, sometimes when they try to have them. And then there's, there's even a, a, only a very few of those who have them whenever they want to. So that, that pyramid, you know, we kind of did up upside down pyramid. So there's lots and lots of people who have, um, oh, uh, you know, tele pathic connections who have out of body experiences who uh, affect their their health with their mind and uh, that's all these things are common i've i've read that if you survey the public at large and say have you ever had a paranormal experience and list all these sorts of things that uh, have no physical explanation which we call paranormal which means other than physical because only only physical is normal uh, then you get about an 80% so that's hundreds of millions of people have these experiences. They j just don't have control over them. They don't understand them. They don't know where they come from. They don't know how to do it when they want to. It's just stuff that sometimes happens seemingly on its own. Or even if they can make it happen, it's very often on. They can't always make it happen. And, and once it does happen, it just happens however it happens and goes its own way. And there's no, there's no uh, control. They're not able to actually uh, use it more other than just uh, accept the experience. So why is that? The reason that's, that's the case is because most people are full of fear, ego, and belief. And these things, we'll just add, you know, and these are derivatives. Actually, the ego and the belief are, for the most part, derivatives of the fear. So we just say fear, and that's the key thing. But out of fear, you derive things like ego, belief, and expectations, you know, wants, needs, desires, and lots of stuff that are all really parts of ego and parts of, uh, of belief. And all of this stuff gets in the way. They have uh, beliefs that say that this sort of thing's impossible. Therefore, when it happens, they just simply deny it or say that it was just random. So there it is. Ask them and they'll say, no, I've never had that happen. Neither has anybody else. You know, people who think they have it happen, they're just making it up. So, how is it you ask, do you know that it's real? And uh, how do you get to the point where it's, where it's uh, something steady, something you can study? Well, you know it's real only through statistics, only through doing a lot of, of experiments. You have to do a lot of experiments to convince yourself this is real. And after you've done them hundreds and hundreds of times and you have very consistent results... Just like any of the other soft sciences, you say, well, hell, you know, the probability that all these results uh, coming out the way they do, just being random, is very, very low. So you compute a, a statistical significance, and it turns from, from uh, you know, probability, you know, into, into science. So that's the same way you do it. And the way I tell people that they can do this is there's some very easy things you can do that uh, or you can train yourself to do that will then convince you that it's real. And one of them is you can use your mind to heal, to remote view. Those are two easy things to do. And if you work at it for, you know, six, six months, a year, two or three years, and you know, when I say easy, you know, it's easy like uh, playing the flute or playing the, you know, piano is easy. You don't sit down at a piano and then push its keys for a week and say, I can't do it. I quit. It's impossible. Nobody can play this thing. Obviously, that's not the case. If you sit down and work at that piano for five years, you should be able to play it reasonably well. If you work at it for 30 years, you'll play it much better. If you started when you were five years old and, and now you're, you're 60 and you've been playing it all your life and you play it many hours a day, you should be really, really, really good at it. You should be a star. Coming to, when it comes to playing the piano. You see, it's the same way with this. Don't sit down and say, well, I tried to 
remote view and nothing happened. Well, of course, nothing's probably going to happen the first time you try to remote view because you have all this noise in your mind, which is generated from the ego primarily, which is generated from the fear. So first you have to learn to quiet the mind. Get the signal to noise down to the point that you can actually find the signal. When your mind is so full of noise, you can't find a signal. If you find it, it's so small, it doesn't necessarily, you know, you don't even notice it sometimes. So first thing is meditation. Meditation is just a tool for quieting the noise in the mind. And you can be successful at meditation whether you have a lot of fear and ego or not. But the less you have, the more successful you'll be and the more consistent you will be with the meditation. And once you quiet the mind and can get to what I call a point consciousness state, then these other things, this like remote viewing or using your mind to affect physical things, is, is a, a, a fairly easy thing to do. That's when you start taking data. So if you try to use your mind to uh, heal someone who has a particular problem, if that person gets better right after you work on them, doesn't mean a thing. That's just one data point. That person has to get better right after you work on them, you know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times because sometimes it's just chance that that person will get better anyway. So the way you prove to yourself that it's real is through these kinds of experiments, just working with it. And it may take you years to get to the point that you can effectively take data. And then another some years to collect enough data that you're confident of what your results are. So that's, it just takes time. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a quick thing. It's not like looking at a rock and measuring how much it weighs. You know, we can do that very quickly. You pick the rock up, drop it on a scale, we're done. There's the answer. This is not like that. This is uh, not a hard science. This is a soft science that requires statistics, which means you have to do a lot of cases and see if, how, the, how the trends, how the statistics works. Is it statistic, are your results statistically significant? And just to be able to take the data is probably going to take you some time to learn to quiet your mind so you can even be, you know, step up to the plate to take the data in the first place. So it's a little more difficult than weighing a rock. Uh, it's a little more difficult than doing sociology or uh, psychology because there um, it's just a matter of you know, getting a degree in those subjects so you know what you're doing and then doing the research. Here, you can't go to college to find out how to get into point consciousness. You know, that's something you're going to need to do on your own. It's, it's, it's a personal thing. So that's how you, you do it. And the one thing that you that you pointed out was a was an experiment that Bob got Dennis and I to do. Dennis Menerick was another person who was also working with me at the same time I was at Monroe Laboratories. He and I kind of started there together and worked together. And Bob had us go out of body, in other words, defocus from the from the physical virtual reality and focus in some other reality and meet in that other reality and then go on some sort of adventure there. In other words, go places, see things, meet people, you know, kiss babies, uh, you know, look at, look at scenery, do whatever, and uh, try to do things that were evidential, not, not just say, well, I'm looking at a mass of gray clouds, and that's all there is to it. Well, that's not very evidential, because that's just the same. Everywhere you look, looks the same. So there's really very little evidential data there. And we did. Dennis and I met uh, uh, above the lab, uh, just kind of got out of body, uh, went up above the lab, got connected, uh, met each other, and went off on an adventure. And when we came back, we were in uh, isolation booths, so we could could not hear. These things were electromagnetic shielded. They were uh, acoustically shielded. And we had one empty isolation booth between us, so it was even more shielded. So we did this and came out and gave gave our, in, you know, told, we had been telling our own stories while we were in the booth, what we were experiencing. That's how Bob tra trained us. So we were in these altered states in the out-of-body, and we were still being able to move the physical mouth and tongue and lips and talk. That's how we were trained to, to do this. So we were individually talking to a tape recorder and to Bob Monroe through our individual experiences together, if you will. Each of us talking individually. Neither one of us could hear the other. 
Uh, Bob could hear us both. He could talk to us both or talk to us individually, but we could not hear each other. So that's what we did, and we came out of the booths. Bob uh, started both of the reels playing. He had my individual, you know, Tom speaking, and then there was Dennis speaking on another track. He had like an eight-track tape recorder, and he ran both tracks, my track and Dennis's track, Back together, and there was Dennis and I actually having conversations, talking to each other, answering each other's questions, describing the things we saw, the people we met, what we did, why we did it. And it was absolutely stunning how clear it was that we were indeed together in this experiment. The, the statistical uh, probability of being able to answer somebody else's question when you, you couldn't hear the question and then actually Dennis wasn't even saying the questions. You know, these were just things that, that happened that we were doing. So he was just telling Bob and reporting on it. He says, Bob, well, we just, yeah, just talking with Tom and uh, we talked about this and that and decided that we were going to go do this, you see. And I might be reporting, yeah, well, I'm talking to Dennis now and we're talking about this and we've decided to go do that. So that's, those are the kind of two things and if they and if we were doing that at the same time and, and came up with the same subject of where we were going and reported that the conversation was such and such then there it was so it was really really clear that was a big aha moment for me because there's a big difference to understanding that you're doing something really really strange intellectually because you have the data and at a gut level you know uh, actually accepting that I didn't accept it. I'm a scientist. You know, accepting this was a hard thing to do. So when I, when that happened, then I kind of got it at the at the gut level. It was at the being level. I accept that it was real. After that, I had no need to question: Is this real anymore? It uh, that that was the answer for me. Now Dennis was a different answer. We did strange things every day when we were out at that lab. So just a strange thing wasn't going to convince you it was real. If you were, he, Dennis is a is an electronic engineer, so both of us had pretty high levels of of, of uh, proof before we uh, got to the point that we said this is real, and that was where I crossed my threshold for that. Dennis crossed his, you know, and, and some other kind of thing. But uh, so that's the story you were talking about, and that's. Uh, why most people can't do it because they're not, their minds are noisy. They have all this uh, stuff going on. Yeah. And if you're going to, you know, they're connected to this physical reality. All this ego stuff is connected here in the yeah. virtual reality. So it keeps, them, it keeps them connected here. And many times they have fear. They get into the, another reality frame and suddenly it's like, wow, I don't have any control here. And look, there's things going on. And I'm, you know, they feel like uh, you know, babes uh, without, any, without any understanding, without any control. And because they need control, that uh, freaks them out and they, they get scared and they come back. So that's another, that's another reason. Yeah, <clears throat> but if we assume that the, uh, the, the purpose of this world system is efficiency, uh, why is it that, that uh, as you said, it, it sounds strange to common people, you know? How, how is it that it's is hard not to access it but to become aware of it you know so let's take a guy that is not uh, that is uh, isolated uh, in the nature you know and how could he come to that understanding you know, you know without studying like you did and and uh, if he can't come to that understanding what's the purpose of uh, those dimensions if they are so hard to reach you know Oh, like become aware of them. Okay. One last thing: um, what what is near this uh, experience is uh, related. To, uh, what, how are they related to to this, and are they a sort of uh, system leaking, or or you know um, a bigger picture that that comes to mind? But why why at that time? Okay, um, I'll try to remember all those. First is uh, <laughs> yeah. how do they how do they. Um you know, what do they do? So you just take a naive person and says, well, I'd like to experience the, uh, the larger consciousness system. How do I go do that? I'm not going to get in the lab and work with people f for you know, a decade like Dennis and I did. So what they can do uh, to get started, I'd actually send them to the uh, my workshops that I get up on, on YouTube because at the end of the workshop, what I usually do is on a Friday, I, talk, I give just a, an overview of what's going on. 
Saturday, I do theory. Why does it work? How does it work? What's the point and purpose? Then Sunday, we do applications. And I teach people there. I give them the, the instruction how, how to um, experience the larger consciousness system and the, do, the you know, things to do, things to not do, and so on. So I'd start there because that's where you'd get some, some, some instruction and you'd get some, uh, some things to try sure. to do. So sure. that would be a good. That'd be a good place to start. And what really I have them doing is healing with their minds and remote viewing because those are easy to do. And I'd say 30, 40 percent of the people get successes on their on their uh, their healing, diagnosing, and and uh, remote viewing right there without any preparation, without studying, without ever trying. You know, just the first time they ever tried it. We get probably a forty, maybe forty. Yeah, in there. Around 40% have success immediately. That's how easy it is. It's just not that hard. Now, once they have some success, they end up then having less success because now they've got some um, emotion. They've got some, uh, there, there's some fear like, well, gee, I got it. What if I, you know, can I do this, this again? And now they have their intellects in it. And as soon as their intellect gets in it, it doesn't work for them very very well. Whereas the first time they were just open. Oh, this is a little crazy. I'm just going to try it and see what happens. That's the right attitude. The attitude of oh, that really worked. Now I need to get serious and do this. You know, and they, now they have their their ego and their intellect in it because now they're trying to do it, and the trying gets in the way of actually doing it. So it's one of these things that uh, you just it's it's not a technique that that you have to know that enables you to do it. It's stopping doing all, all the things that you're doing that inhibits it. So it's not a matter of doing something. It's mostly a matter of not doing all the things that get in the way. So that's, go there and you'll find a, uh, a pathway that if you work on it for some time, will probably uh, render you uh, enough experience in the larger reality that you can claim that, uh, that, that in your mind it's probably probably real. Now I say it's probably real because this again, reality is about probability. You sh should be, you should be uh, um, open-minded and you just approach this with an open mind and no expectations and you need to be skeptical. You should always be skeptical. If it doesn't, you know, if, if, if let's say you do these things and, and it doesn't work out for you or even if it does work out for you and you do heal and you do remote view accurately, you should still be skeptical. What if that was good luck? What if that whatever? Just stay skeptical. And the more you put time into it, that percentage of your skepticism, let's say, I, okay, I think it's probably true uh, 20% and probably my imagination 80%. Fine, that's a good place to start. Five years later, it'll probably be the other way around. It's probably 80% that it is uh, as I experience it and 20% that I'm doing the hallucination and so on I, as you go further that, that uh, the amount of, of skepticism about the reality of what you're doing will just get smaller and smaller but it should never go to zero you should always have some skepticism about what you're doing uh, otherwise you will likely uh, wander down some, some path that uh, your ego wants to take rather than uh, doing what's, what's real. So that was part of the first question. How do you do it? Uh, remote viewing and healing are the easy things to, to do that most everybody can do if they, they uh, work at it. And you can go to any number of classes for out-of-body, any number of classes for remote viewing, and go on the web and, and Google those things because there's, there's hundreds of people that would like to uh, teach you how to do those things. And they will work with you if you want to do that, but you can do it just on your own. The second one is what question was, what purpose? You know, why do this? There is no uh, requirement whatsoever to do this or any paranormal thing. Um, it's not really very important to what's most important, and what's most important is the purpose of why you're here. What, what are you doing here? Who are you and, you know, and what are you supposed to be trying to achieve? And that is you're supposed to be growing up, lowering your entropy, uh, increasing the quality of your consciousness. That's the role. And you can do that without ever going out of body or remote viewing anything or any of the other paranormal things are not required. 
the only reason for doing these sorts of things would be if you are a left brain person who has to have the experience prove it to yourself okay i just can't i just can't uh, believe or i can't connect with this as being real and Less I experience it as being real. So if you're one of those who has to experience it in, in order to work with it, it's like, okay, I have, to, I have to spend five years learning how to play the piano or meditate. But I don't want to do that if I find out five years later that all I've been doing is talking to myself, you see. So in order to make this investment, I need to have some sense that uh, I'm doing something that's real. Well, it may take you five years just to convince yourself you're doing something that's real. But in any case, you need to do that. And uh, if you're one of those persons, you won't start. You can't seriously work. You can't give it the attention it needs unless you first prove it to yourself. For those people, that's really the only value that's going out of body and, and remote viewing or doing other, uh, you know, uh, looking at future your probability and there's lots of things you can do you know past lives uh, empathy with people uh, seeing the world seeing their reality through their eyes and all kinds of things you can do there but um, there's no point in it other than the fact that it can help you grow up it doesn't have to help you know you can grow up without it but it can help you grow up because it helps you uh, get excited have the interest uh, put the work into it that uh that you need to put into it. So the, that's the, that's the why, why bother. Now, for me, I had a different purpose. I'm a physicist. I was trying to model reality, and uh, I needed to do research there. You may or may not have that drive. If, you know, if you're a science guy at heart and that's what you need to do, then you, know, you, you can do that too. But most people really aren't all that interested in doing science. They just want to have the experience so they know whether it's real or not. That's the thing. And that's a, you know, if you're one of those, then you need to go do that. You have to do that first. I was one of those. I had to do that first. Uh, some people don't. Mostly we, the right brain people, uh, the people who are very intuitive, they don't need logical process. They just skip right over logical process and go right to the answer. They just can't explain it. And everybody calls them airheads and that sort of thing. But uh, they offer know things that nobody else does. So that's... Um, that's another path, and that's perfectly fine to them. They, have, they don't like logical process that's slow and tedious and gets in the way. They can, they can go past that, that uh, very quickly. So that's kind of the, you know, what's the, what's the purpose? Why, do you, why should you do it? Well, only if you want to. If, uh, if it's not important to you, then it's not important. Just let it, let it go. You can grow up without it. And what was your last one? You had a you had a third yeah. one. You slipped in there at the end. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was wondering why those experiences can happen sometimes triggered by by something else, like uh, in the sleep state or when you die. Uh, if you think that near death experiences are already this, yeah. why 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 does this happen? You know, like that uh, without the possibility for. Are the, the the experiencer to understand what what's happening? Okay. What what that happens lots of times, and that's why this number uh, of people who have had some kind of paranormal experience that's why that number is up at eighty uh, percent. You know, most of those people of that eighty percent that says that there probably isn't one hundred to one percent that had any control over it. Nor does it, nor would they experience something that was, uh, happens all the time. It was just this, like, this one event, this thing that happened. Or maybe it happened two or three times. But uh, typically, what this is about is that it's, a, it's an eye-opener. It's a mind-opener. It's a, an event that is given to you if you are ready to see that there is a bigger picture than just the physical. Now, why is that important? Well, our, our mission here is to grow up to become love, to uh, increase the quality of our consciousness. And if you are entirely focused on the physical, that's a much slower process. That's like learning how to swim with a cement block tied to your back. You know, it's just hard to do. So to see that reality, that world, that your life, that, that you are a, are a multidimensional being and 
understanding this is a big aid into your growing up. If not, there's nothing important that isn't physical. If it isn't physical, it doesn't exist. You see, that's very limiting into limiting for your understanding. So the system whose who's, uh, success, see, the system needs to lower its entropy. This consciousness system is a digital information system. It needs to limit its entropy, and we, we individuated units of consciousness, are part of its, of its uh, scheme to do that. As we lower our entropy, we're part of it. It lowers its entropy. So you see, we're part of this evolutionary process of the consciousness system. That's what we do. So that's the... Uh, that's why that happens. The system wants us to succeed, wants us to, to uh, improve the quality of our consciousness, wants us to grow up, and to help us do that, it gives us these little experiences of the larger reality, which is, it opens our minds. And even if we say, yeah, yeah, it's all physical, but you know, I had this dream once, and it was really, really complex, and two weeks later, it happened exactly, all right? Now, that person has their mind open. Even if they are a scientist and claim uh, to be a materialist, they know at a deeper level that there are things that happen and go on that cannot be an answered by a materialist viewpoint, from a materialist viewpoint. Tom, so I that just you, opens there, them to a bigger picture. Is there a, a potential flip side to that where, you know, we talk about the people who are very left brain and might need to be sort of awakened to this uh, other possibility. But uh, do you see a need for people who might be, let's, let's say, too right-brained or something, maybe a need for an embodiment and things like that? Yeah, it works both ways. The system helps us move in a direction that we are ready to move and need to move for our, our, for our growth. So if, if there's a person who is very uh, left brain and everything is physical, they, if they are ready, if they can deal with it, you know, if it's not going to just frighten them and, and push them into denial, which is not helpful at all, but if they're ready to deal with it, then they're good candidates for getting a, um, you know, that kind of an experience. And on the other hand, if they're right-brained and they get it all, but they don't have the logical process, they often you know, get nudged toward, you know, a, a more logical process, understanding it, trying to uh, figure it out. So it, it works both ways because both of those are out of balance. If you're all right brain, you're out of balance. If you're all, all left brain, and when I say all, I mean, that's how you run your life. You run your life out of your head. That's uh, a left brain thing. If you're right brain, you run your life out of your intuition. And neither one of those is really... The, uh, the best way to be. You need to be both. You need to have both well developed so you are all left brain and all right brain both together all of the time. That means you, you are in very in intuitive, you're in, you're in touch, you're connected to a larger reality but at the same time a logical pr process uh, is, is the way you, you operate and run your life. So that, that's, you know, yeah, the system pushes people however it is they need to be pushed. But the very large majority of people don't see the bigger picture until they have something personal, some big picture thing happen to them, and then they get it. Mostly they don't talk about it because they feel like people will think they've imagined it or that they're crazy or something, but they got it just the same. Near-death experiences are like that as well. That's somebody who, uh, who uh, actually clinically dies but is, brought, is resuscitated. And while they're clinically gone, they'll often have some sort of an experience. Well, that experience is just there um, for a couple of reasons. One, it may be something given to them, or once they clinically die, they may begin the transition uh, and get some of the transition experience before it looks like they get resuscitated and then it comes back. It depends on that probability. If the probability is high that they will get resuscitated, then it's generally something that has to be given to them. If the probability is low that they get resuscitated, then they may just, just be starting out on part of their transition, but uh, the odd thing happens and they get pulled back. So all of these things are things that uh, are important, and they do add, 
it up. You know, if you get a, if one of these things happens, some paranormal things happen to you, it's not the paranormal thing. It's not the inf information you get that's important or the dream that you saw, this, this, parent, this uh, precognitive dream may have been mundane. I saw somebody, you know, they went to the gas station and they dropped their, you know, wedding ring off their finger into the back seat. And then, you know, it's just mundane stuff. Later it comes true, but what happened is not important. It's the fact that it did happen, you know, that you have the experience. It's the experience that's important, important, not the content of that experience. So people wonder about, well, gee, what did all that mean? Why did I get that? Well, what you got was, was not as insignificant. It's that you got it at all is what's significant. Yeah, so Does that answer your question? Yeah, I saw an article recently, uh, kind of what you were saying there. Uh, I forget who it was. It was a, uh, a famous atheist uh, movement figure had some sort of experience with, where uh, an old radio started playing. He tells this whole story about it was tied into his wedding night and all these sorts of things. And he kept using this expression, my atheism was shaken to its core, or, you know, or something like that, or skepticism. And uh, which obviously, in one respect, the, the cynic in me, that sort of proves that atheism in itself is a dogma, it is a belief system, because that's, that's the phraseology we would use for, you know, my faith was shaken. Sure. <laughs> you know, so in one respect, I get a kick out of it that way. On the other hand, it's absolutely, you know, these little moments that all these, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I know so many people who are so tied down to that mindset. And when something happens that you you can't explain, it'll certainly throw a question mark on that pretty darn quickly. What, yeah. what about, again, let's you know, sort of flip this script one more time and say, so we have the people who are in this one mindset and this could wake them up to the other possibility. What about the things that make us question our faith, belief, uh, hopefulness, etc.? You know, you were talking about the idea of World of Warcraft. It sort of seems like that is the world we're living in. It is a pretty brutal reality most days. Um, mm -hmm. How do you respond to the system, you know, the, the idea that the system is either a quote-unquote negative one, right? We have this is a very old Gnostic idea that... Yes, the world is a virtual reality, but it's sort of like a, a prison, right? So you have that Philip K. Dick black iron prison or this, mm -hmm. this Gnostic idea that it's, it's basically something for us to be trapped in. Or you have this sort of more new agey pronoia idea that the, it is there and it is a system that is actually serving us in some way. How would you respond to these sorts of questions? Well, what you see is what we are. So we are in a, a virtual reality, but we are consciousness, and we are to experience here. That's our, that's our thing. We come here and we have experience. Now, what makes experience is our choices. We have free will. And depending on how we make these choices, we tend to evolve toward uh, lower entropy or higher entropy, toward love or toward fear. Now, you can't have free will in the system and say, you have have the free will to choose what I want you to choose. That's not free will. You have to have the free will to make the wrong choice if you have the free will to make the right choice. You can't have half a free will. You can, you're, you're free as long as you do what I want you to do. So we have this, this bunch of consciousnesses interacting with each other. They have lots of fear, lots of ego, lots of beliefs, and they interact. Some of them are evolving. Some of them are de-evolving. Some of them are just, you know, wandering around clueless in the playing field. They're not really doing much of anything. They're wasting a lot of time. So they interact together. All of this fear and all of this ego interacts with each other. Choices are made. Uh, intents form. So they have intents. And these intents modify future probability. It's part of the feedback system. So you're, you're in Intent modifies future probability. This is a probabilistic simulation. It's not a deterministic simulation. Deterministic simulations don't make any sense. They are not efficient, not productive, and unnecessary. Why would you do something that's terribly inefficient when it's unnecessary? So, in any case, 
Um, that's the situation. So why do we live in such a tough world with so much negativity, you know, so much greed, so much, uh, you know, fear? Because that's who we are. That's the world we create. That's a reflection of us, of we the people. Well, that's our average or our common level of growth is what we see. We create it. And we have this idea that if we just, uh, you know, change the government, change the, the money system, change the, you know, things in a way, that would make everything better. It wouldn't make anything better for very long. Well, it may make things marginally better for a while. But the fact is, the world we live in is going to have to represent us because we make it, we create it, we do it. It's our choice, our intents that make it the way it is. It's the sum of all the choices being made by all the people on it is why it is the way it is. And those won't change. So as long as the people don't grow up any and you have the same quality of consciousness, you're going to get basically the same result. You see, that's, that's just a fact. So it's us that makes it like that. And we have lots of choices. We can grow up and it would be a lot better. It'd be a kinder, gentler, uh, more satisfying, less frustrating place to be. Or we can uh, de-evolve and it can be a meaner, tougher uh, place than what we have. But it, it's us. It's, it's not that this, uh, this world is different. You know, we, we see ourselves as separate from it. That's these other views you're talking about. We're separate. This world is just here and it is the way it is. And we, for some unfortunate reason, get placed in this hellhole, you know, because we've been naughty children and this is our punishment or because, you know, whatever. That's, um, you know, they come up with their own reasons of why, it, why it's, it's like that. But basically, they see themselves as being placed in a situation. Well, that's not the way it is. They are part of the situation. We all create this situation, and we can change it. But we change it by growing up, and that's the way it is. Now, you can have any kind of government. doesn't matter what it is. If all the people in that system, say you have a system, if you want, make it a country and put walls up around that country so it just is a, is a system uh, all by itself. Whatever that system is, if it's, and start with a government that's any sort of government, can be a totalitarian mean dictatorship if you like start it anyway if the people grow up and become love the system will change to support that you see the system whatever it is the money the economic system whatever it'll change to support that because it will be a reflection of that caring and love it'll be about that other it won't be about greed greed's about self fear is about self it'll be about other so if the people grow up the system will grow up the the leaders we pick represent us they're picked out of the, you know, out of the same pool of population. They're, they're just like us. So you, you take a, you know, and another way to say that is if you went out and randomly selected somebody and made him the, you know, the leader for life, chances are not much would change because basically that's the way we are. There's a lot of ego, a lot of fear, a lot of belief. It's what about me? Greed. I want to control. You see? And... It, you take the little guy who has very little power, well, all he can do is argue with his wife, kick the dog, and, you know, and keep doing what people tell him. Whereas the guy who has lots of power you know, can make huge messes and affect a lot of people with his ego and his fear. The little guy can only affect his wife, kids, and the dog with his ego and his fear because everybody else is his boss. So that's the difference. But one isn't a whole lot different than the other. We're not... We're, we're not in the problems we're in because of our terrible leaders. We're in the problems we're in because we are like that ourselves. And I say we, I'm taking plural. We humanity, we the people, not we every individual. Obviously, there's lots of individuals who are very loving, wonderful people, but there's not enough of them. Yeah, and if I may, just to argue you from like a physiological point of view <laughs> the prefrontal cortex of, of human beings is still a rel relatively new thing we're still grasping with like a new technology our own inner technology so we're always projecting out into the world and building new toys and calling that technology and how do we master that thing outside of ourselves instead of mastering what's right inside our own heads and 
so human beings are trying to reconcile three brains in one. I was just talking with Guillaume about this before we came on the air. And that's extremely complex. So we have our mammalian brain, our reptilian brain, and our prefrontal cortex. How do we make all that work? And there is, of course, what you're talking about, this uh, extra physical reality interplaying with consciousness and interacting with physical reality. And so they're kind of two sides of the same coin. But I mean, if we're just, you know, if people want to keep their feet on a physical ground, if you want to argue it from this point of view, you have this triune brain or this three-way brain. And we're still adolescents dealing with that in the same way of, of what you're saying in a larger symbolic sense and also from a very grounded sense as well. But, you know, we're still dealing with We're not mature. Human beings have been around for a long time, so we assume we have it figured out, but we don't have shit figured out. Okay. Um, well, that's part of it. Yeah, the way to, kind of a way to see this from a different viewpoint. So the viewpoint you talk about is that we have a brain and the brain um, uh, modifies or has has some impact on our behavior. So we've got this, you know, reptilian brain and, and that does with the fear, uh, you know, uh, what, um, fight or flight and that sort of thing. We have the kind of that basic, we have, this, you know, we have all these different brain type inputs and we poor little unfortunate people, you know, we're kind of at the mercy of this brain that has all these functions and we're trying to, uh, you know, kind of quiet some of them and, and, uh, do more with others, but it's just, the brain doesn't run consciousness, you see. It's a virtual brain. Your brain is just data. Matter of fact, unless somebody cuts open your head, the system never has any cause to even render a brain. It's just that you probably have a brain, so you act certain ways. You see, the, the brain is a physical thing. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't push anything. The, the body... That's the constraints on what the consciousness does. Now, a little story to, to kind of explain this. <clears throat> Sometime back uh, on the Internet, I read about uh, an article that was saying it was a, an amazing thing, biologists thought, that sheep seemed to have morality. There was moral behavior among sheep. And what they had witnessed was that uh, a uh, sheep, Mother sheep would take care of baby sheep if that baby's mother was killed or gone or not there to, to take care of it. The other mama sheep would come in and let that outsider lamb suckle. And they looked at that and they said, well, that's, all, that's counter to what we know about biology. Animals are supposed to only do things for their own benefit to further their own genetic material. And they don't give sustenance to to uh, outsiders at the expense of their own genetic material. In other words, this, this, uh, this mother sheep had her own lambs to suckle. And her, her sustenance, her milk, could only be spread so far, but she was sharing it. She was taking that away from her own to help another. And they said, that is moral behavior. It's moral choice. So the thing we scientists tend to do when we find something like that is, you know, we kill the lamb, right? That's... Uh, and we chop open the skull and we look at the brain and, aha, look, there's the lobe in which where moral choice is done. Because humans who have moral choice, they have this lobe and they've centered, you know, put people in a brain scan, give them moral questions, and they see that that's the part of the brain that kind of lights up when they're doing moral choice. So then they have the idea that their brain evolved this lobe which allowed them to be moral and that's what we're seeing as the result of this brain development. We're seeing that morality. That is just backwards. You see, the sheep are conscious. They're a consciousness. They're doing the same thing we're doing. They're trying to evolve the quality of their consciousness too. The sheep became moral by choice, by free will choice. As they did, the brain had to modify to support that. It's just a virtual brain. But the physical body, including the brain, sets the constraints, you see? So here I am a consciousness, and my avatar can't jump but so, so far because the rule set has constraints. My, conscious, uh, my, my avatar can't, uh, you know, learn uh, five languages in a weekend because it has constraints. The rule set that enabled it to evolve to, to what it is has these constraints. And we, consciousness, get a data stream that is constrained according to the rule set. Hello? Did I, I just lose you guys? 
brain function that is pushing us and pulling us all around. It's the other way way around. We have fear. We have ego. We have all these beliefs. We've got these fear of, you know, we've, we've fright and flight and what is it? Fight or flight. We've got all this stuff and our brain represents us and it's there not pushing us around, but it's there to support who we are. You see? Yes. So you just look at it from the from the other side. That's 180 degrees out of phase from the from the normal way of looking at it. So we have this <laughs> reptilian brain and these other kinds of brains, and they are what they are because we that that they have to be there to allow us as consciousness to express ourselves because that's the way we are. You see now. Now let's say we stop expressing ourselves in terms of fear and, and greed and all these other kinds of th things. Well, then those parts of our brain begin to shrink because now we only express those things every once in a long while. So that part of the brain just goes away. And if we spend all our time in love and caring about other, well, the part of the brain that does that and the moral part of the brain or whatever, that grows. You see, so we're not driven by our brain. We drive the brain. Consciousness is fundamental and primary, and this virtual reality is a, is a generated, is a derived thing, is a computed thing. So consciousness doesn't come from the brain. People don't get out of their body because their consciousness lives in their brain and their body, and then somehow it flies out. You know? All of that, that is just wrong, and it's the way we think because we are habituated to a physical uh, set of constraints in this reality frame. So we tend to think in terms of those constraints. We think physical comes first and everything else is derived from it. That's why we have those, those ideas. But you see, the backwards, if you see it the other way, it makes more sense. And it's actually the way it, the way it works. So yeah. first we have to grow up and then our brain will change. Yes, and I agree. And I, I didn't <laughs> mean to... Uh give the impression I was opposed to what you're saying. I'm just, uh, I was being a little bit of devil's advocate, but not being, being devil's advocate. I'm just saying there's an, other ways of seeing it, but you're absolutely right in that. We know for sure that we don't always need a brain for consciousness. That's pretty clear. It's <laughs> like, uh, I, I love the analogy, Bruce Grayson, one of the leading researchers in this field. He said that, uh, yeah, yeah, same here. Same here. Could you repeat yourself? You said there was somebody. Consciousness. Said, There's somebody who said. I'm sorry. What's and the that's the last I heard. I just lost audio. I didn't hear about the last 30 seconds. I hear you just fine. Yes. Okay. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, you've been breaking up all along, but usually the dropouts have only been like a half a second dropouts, so it didn't make a difference. We could just kind of. You know, <laughs> Piece it together. Plug, plug in, yeah, as, as we went, but that one was a long one. Diffraction. Okay. All right, well, well, interrupt me again if for some reason it, it happens. But I was just saying that we need to extend a model of consciousness. We need a relativity for consciousness to compensate for these altered states, whether you're near, near death or you're in a yogic state or something. And so your model and, and the ideas that you're putting forth are kind of going in that direction. And it's clear that, again, like you have hydrocephalus where people have, I don't know, 5 to 10% of a normal brain and they still are perfectly functioning human beings. Not, not all the time, but uh, a, a strange chunk of the time. And then near-death experience, people see things, hear things they should never see, hear, or experience. And those have convinced me. And so your work a a adds to that pile, and I see it as very important in that sense. So I'll stop there because I don't want my mic to get messed up again. So go on. <laughs> okay, well, the difference is is that a lot of people uh, are aware that these things ha happen, right? That the, you know, the NDEs and, and the other things you mentioned, a lot of people are aware of that. And many uh, will point to those things and say, see, you know, reality is really bigger than just the physical and, and so on. But what's really been missing up to this time, and things like that we've known for, for a long time, it goes back... Uh, you know, thousands of years. You know, you can read uh, Taoism, you know, the uh, Tao Te Ching, and you can see that all these same kind of concepts, knowing this about the reality has been around a long, long time. What's been missing is a coherent um, explanation, a coherent model that not only 
describes the metaphysics and the spiritual and uh, the subjective part of the world, but that same model has to also explain physics and explain you know, why physics is the way it is and solve physics problems with it. So if we have this one understanding that does both of those and does all of that, then that's a model that, uh, now I'm not saying that's reality. Again, don't, you know, don't ever confuse the model of reality with reality. But at least that allows us to talk about all these things as one, one, one set of ideas and we can explain all of the stuff, be it the you know, relativity and quantum mechanics or be it a near-death experience or how telepathy is possible and why precognitive dreams are the way they are and how is it that uh, you know, people, what, is, what was it called a long time, the power of positive thinking. How is it that people can modify their reality with their intent? Uh, the placebo effect, how is it they can modify their health with their intent? And then all of these things that are in our, in our experience base become uh, just uh, completely uh, understandable within one context that also does quantum mechanics and also does uh, you know, physics. So that's kind of the, the, uh, kind of the overview of what, we've, of what we really have been trying to work toward for a long time. And I've got part of that. And other people, of course, have been adding to that and describing things. And it all works together. You know, and it's, you know, my, my own models and things, they'll be added to over the years and whatever and change their rear ends to better suit. But I see that all the people you talk about and all the people that are working on us, we're all working toward the same goal. And it's all, um, shall I say, it's all additive. All the work that everybody has done in these areas, whether it's in physics or metaphysics or theology or spirituality, all of it adds to together and makes for a better, more comprehensive, bigger picture. So it's all good, good and it's all necessary and it all adds. Um, <clears throat> Tom, could you extrapolate uh, on the notion of uh, entropy and how can uh, one lower his entropy? Okay, yes. Uh, the idea of entropy, uh, just kind of skip back to the statement that the larger consciousness system is a digital information system and information uh, requires well let's put it this way what is information it's structure okay if you have all randomness if all your bits are random there is no information in order to have information some of those bits need to be structured into some sort of order right now we think maybe structure into letters of the alphabet or sounds of speech or something. Well, that's structure. That's not randomness. Random sound will never be speech. You see, there's no information in it. It has to have its certain sounds and inflections and, and uh, that sort of thing before it becomes language. So order is what creates information out of randomness. Well, entropy is a measure of disorder. If, if entropy is high, that means there's a lot of disorder, a lot of randomness very little information. If entropy is low, then you have more information, more content, more significance of that content. So now, if you have a digital information system, if it evolves, it's evolving toward lower entropy states, more information, more significance to its content, more structure, more meaning, you see. And if you have a digital information system that is de-evolving, it's becoming more and more random, less content, less value. And if that continues to de-evolve, you'll have nothing but randomness, and then you have no consciousness at all. There's no information. So randomness is death to an information system. That's how it dies. It becomes random. And growth and becoming more and growing up is lowering entropy. Um, more information, more content more value to the information, more significance and meaning. So that's, you know, that's the way the whole system works. So what we're here, we are pieces of this logical, of, we are pieces of this larger consciousness system. And our job is to grow up, to lower our entropy, add some sort of content, some sort of value to the whole. And we do that by becoming love. Now, why is it that we, what's, what does becoming love have to do with all this? Well, a consciousness system 
is not just a one thing. It's a large number of individuated consciousness. It's a lot of individual things interacting. It's a social system. Whenever you have interaction, you have a social system. And this larger conscious system has broken off uh, and, and had a lot of individuated units of consciousness, just like uh, biological things did, right? Biological Logical things were just all single-celled, and then uh, you know they could divide and made multi-cell, and these things divide, which made other things, and they interact with each other. The interaction raises the novelty, the the choices. The number of choices you have goes up if you have more things interacting. See, there's more choices than if it's just one thing or two things. Multiple things create choices. Choices that are made well enable you to evolve or de-evolve to. You know, you can now construct things that are complex, that are low entropy, if you have lots of things to construct with. If it's just one or two things, you, your construction is kind of limited. So we find out that consciousness then has evolved to a multi-celled thing with lots of cells of consciousness, and these interact with each other with free will, and that's what drives the system. That's how the system evolves. So now here we are. I, I did all this back ground to say here we are and our job is to lower our entropy because we're parts of the system and it's a social system and a social system improves does better lowers its entropy if it's cooperative if the if the units inside the social system cooperate with each other help each other uh, if it's about each other and not just about themselves if it's that's it's called love if it's just about them, if it's all about me, how do I get what I need and want, and then how, how do I keep it? If somebody else has something that I want, then how do I take it away from them and keep it? Um, if it's all about self, then that's fear. And there's no trust. There can't be trust. With no trust, you know, there's no cooperation, and so on. And you have, a, you have, have the opposite. You have a system that de-evolves. Fear is very divisive. Things don't build and construct. As soon as somebody constructs something worth taking, then others conspire to take it. And uh, that's, the, that's the fear side. Okay, So you have the fear side and the love side. Becoming love means lowering your entropy and, and evolving the quality of your consciousness. The fear side you know, represents higher entropy and de-evolving the quality of your consciousness. So now we've gone through through all that background, I'm getting up finally to your question. The, the point is, we're here to lower our entropy, to evolve the quality of our consciousness, or you can call that spiritual growth, if you like. And that's our purpose. That's what we do. Now, how does one go about doing that? Well, the way to do that is find the fear and get rid of it. Now, how do you find the fear? Most of us are driven by our fear and our ego and our beliefs, and we have no idea what that fear and ego and beliefs are. To us, they're just life. It's the way it is. Couldn't be any different. But you can find that fear by looking at the ego. The ego is easy to find. You can find the ego anytime your life is not full of joy, anytime you're not happy and, and pleased and life is wonderful. If that's not your life, you can find fear. You can find ego. Anytime you feel anxiety, upset, angry, frustrated, any of these things that most of us feel you know, all the time, you know, if not every day, every week, all of those things, you feel that way because of your fear. And you express that fear in terms of ego and beliefs. So when you feel that way, let's say you're feeling anger. So if you feel anger or frustration, Find out why. Where is that coming from? Why am I angry? Well, I'm angry because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You say, well, why is it that I need you to have to do these things? Well, if you don't do those things, it's not good for me. I don't get what I want. I don't get what I need. You need to do those things for me. Well, it's all about me, me you see. So keep tracing that back until you find your fear. What is it that you fear that makes you need to have those things? You see, so if you do this, and you're honest with yourself, you will find the fear, ego, and beliefs that drive you. And when you do, you just have to get rid of them. The only antidote for fear is courage. So you have to look at that fear and understand it and be with 
with it and 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 uh, own it. And once you've admitted to it and own it, then you can just be watchful for it. And when that anger pops up in your life, go, oh, I know where that's coming from. Let it go. Stop the anger right in its tracks. Instead, do something positive. If, instead of getting angry with someone, take a deep breath and realize that the they are in the same position as you. Everybody's doing the best they can with what they got to grow up. And we all are driven by our fear and ego. And you don't need to react with your fear and ego to somebody else's fear and ego because that's just pouring gasoline on the fire. It just makes everything worse. So take a deep, big, a deep breath, say something nice and positive, and let it go. That'll be hard to do. You will catch yourself and not catch it in time in the beginning most of the time. But if you work at it consistently, within a few months, three or four months, you'll be very successful. And if you keep working at it, it'll go away. The fear will just disappear because these fears are all paper tigers. All the awful things you think might happen if you know, it doesn't work this way and you don't get what you need and this person doesn't do what they're supposed to, there's no awful things there. It's just your fear. And once you have the courage to let that fear go and work at it, it'll just disappear appear and that'll be one less thing that pushes you around now in your life and makes you feel unhappy upset and angry and frustrated and all the rest of it keep doing that and pretty soon you're a real happy camper your life is full of joy everything is really good and other people just are the way they are and you stop trying to control everything and make it be the way you know is best you say that i know what it's best i know the way these things have to be that's just your ego talking. And then the other people don't do it that way. Now, now you're frustrated and you're angry. And that's your ego. That's your fear. So that's how you beat it. You find it, trace it back, be honest, own it, you know, become one with it. Really get down in with that fear and, and see just where it's coming from. And then when it comes up, stop it. And just don't go there. Instead, do something positive. And if you do that, and you really put a focus on it, in three months, that fear will probably be gone or very low. In six months, it most certainly, you know, will not be bothering you anymore. Then you start with the next fear, all right? You got one. You probably have 20 or 30. You have a lot of them. Start on the next one. Eventually, you get rid of the whole bunch, and you will be, become love. You will turn into a loving, caring people, a caring person that is interested in other. What can I do to help? How can I serve? How can I help the situation? And you don't have a lot of needs and wants and desires the way things have to be. They just go away. So it's not like you have to learn to act good and stuff these needs and, and desires down in your subconscious someplace. You have to learn how to be good and not have those needs and desires at all. They're just not part of you. So that's the difference. All real, real growth haps, happens at the being level, not at the intellectual level. So this is not about how you act. It's about about how you are and on the same idea uh would you say that synchronicity could be a tool to get uh, more information slash uh, meanings absolutely the system wants you to succeed and if it can just dump the right thing at the right time in front of your feet or idea in your mind or in your uh, intuition it will do that if you're ready and open and can use it you'll get all the help that that you need and that's what we call synchronicity it's when something just happens at the right time it's just what we need we walk into a li library and we're full of angst about something and it's almost like one of the, some book you know almost jumps off the shelf in, into your hand you know it's sticking out a little further than the rest it's got a bright red cover that catches your eye whatever it is and you go up and you get it and it's something you can use or you just run into somebody and you're down and out and have been out of work for a month and because you did something nice or, or or thinking positive thoughts you run into somebody who just happens to know somebody who has a job looking for somebody just like you this this is synchronicity it works that way the more you cooperate with it the more your life is like that eventually when you become love when you get rid of all your fear and ego every day is like that everything that that would you know that would be good for you everything that brings you joy it just falls in front of you every day you don't control anything yet 
life gets to be even better than anything you could imagine if even if you were the dictator of, of everything and can control everything. It just works for you. Synchronicity is a is a daily thing. Talk to people who are very right brained and they live in a world of, of synchronicity daily. We left brainers, it just happens every once in a while and we'd look at that and say wow what a circumstance that just just happened at just the right time and then if that does that three or four times in a row maybe, we begin to open is... our minds a little bit maybe something else is going oh, yeah. <laughs> somebody's trying to tell me something or give me a break uh, or slap maybe, me to get uh, my attention this is still um, a bit more into synchronicity can also be a slap but I just kind of want to clarify something here uh, hey Alan here there's something really weird that happens with the audio in this uh, in this last part. It it's funny because during the call with Tom, I kept wanting to I kept thinking I wanted to ask him about the idea of uh, ordered systems versus I, a lot of times synchronicity gets described as non-linear events, and here we have a very clear intrusion of non-linear events. For whatever reason, even though there was no lag on the call, we were all able to understand each other very clearly. Something in the Skype recorder recorded a, some sort of weird lag. So uh, my voice, a lot of times when, when, I, when I'm, uh, Tom and I are, are going back and forth, it sounds like I'm just talking over him. Uh, I hope everyone realizes I didn't do that. During the actual call, I wouldn't do that to Tom. <laughs> but it, 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 for whatever reason, it recorded my audio, his audio on a lag, and mine, some something. Basically, what I'm trying to say is there's going to be a few points where it's going to be a little kind of annoying. I thought of just cutting those chunks out, but I think, I, I think it's. Uh, I think it's understandable this way if I just uh, leave, if I cut out the really egregious parts and leave some of the things that at least you can kind of understand when I'm, it sounds like I'm talking, I might be responding to something that Tom hasn't finished saying for another 10 seconds. I don't know. I don't know exactly what, what the best solution was here, but uh, I think it's so, so few spaces that uh, I'd rather release this audio. Uh, language language can be difficult. When, when you talk about the idea earlier, you know, all these ideas of a sort of, um, however we want to say this, probability functions, right? It's a sort of quantum reality, uh, whatever phrasing you want to use, but everything is a certain probability. Um, makes me think of, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Anton Wilson's maybe logic. Uh, it's it's a it's a very similar idea that okay everything's going to be a certain statistical possibility and you can never say this is this or isn't this you can just say it seems this way to me or it seems likely that it is such and such but there you sort of remove any of the you know quote unquote facts you know what the 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 uh, the rea Exactly. Everything's probable. Nothing is true or untrue. Uh, and it's, it's a sort of really interesting idea. What I guess mm -hmm. I would Everything like is to clarify probable. is when you talk about this idea right. of lowering your entropy, uh, granted, this is... I guess I'm just curious how that would play into the probability functions in the sense of if uh, does our, our probability still stays high, yes? Um, uh, obviously, probability and entropy not the same thing, I'm, but I, I would assume they're in some way related, or is this just a trick of the language? I think um, you're having a language problem, but let me talk to it a little bit. One of the attributes of this virtual reality and we conscious entities that are playing in this virtual reality is that you know, all good schoolhouses, this is a schoolhouse to help us grow up, all good schoolhouses have to have feedback. And we have lots of feedback trails here that... that uh, point us in the right direction because if we do things wrong we do them for the wrong reasons if we have you know if we're working out of greed and fear and anger and stuff our our life starts to suck it starts to get really bad and and so on you know that's why we've created this you know go read the news that's how we've created this thing you know that's that's what we create now on the other hand if we if we act well oh, i was just saying uh, you know your life is full of joy and fun and it, and it's really neat well it's the same for us collectively you know, if, if we are more love-like, then our reality is kinder, gentler, and 
our institutions are uh, more interested in serving than they are in uh, ripping us off. So all of that works, but the connection between probability and entropy is this. We create this reality by making measurements. You know, it's the measurement problem, right? By having intent. A measurement actually brings something into this reality. That means brings it into your data stream. That's what into this reality means. Your reality is all the data that's in all the, the various players' consciousness. That's what makes the reality. Okay, so this reality is modifiable based on our intent. If we have an intention that is, you know, that something will happen, an intention that something will be this way. Let's say that this person, you know, this person uh, has, uh, you know, I don't know what, has scaly skin or something. We have an intention that that will go away. Then we raise the probability that that will go away because our intention modifies the probability. The way things work is there are possibilities. Okay? Our future is full of possibilities. Now, we get to a time where we make a measurement. Okay? The future comes because the clock ticks, and there it is. Now, there's a future coming, this next tick. And what is it going to be? Well, you look at all the possibilities. These possibilities all are associated with the probability because all possibilities are not equal, equally probable. Some possibilities are really out there, maybe one in a million, and other possibilities are, are, are uh, you know, much more likely. So you take all the possibilities, you put them in a distribution, a probability distribution, where we look at the probabilities. Then you take a random draw from the distribution. That doesn't mean you take a random draw from all the possibilities. You take a, dra a random draw uh, of the probability distribution of the possibilities. There's a difference. So the things that are more probable are more likely to be drawn out on this random draw. And I just did a talk about that just four or five days ago at this um, thing I did in Huntsville this past weekend. And if you really want to see that in graphics and whatever, that'll be out on YouTube in a month or two whenever it gets uh, edited. And you, you, can, you can get this more, uh, you know, graphics, a graphical aid, you know, that'll help you with this concept. But what happens is that you, when you make a, a measurement, make a choice, and that means open your eyes, take in data, something, something that, re that requires information to come down your data stream to your consciousness. Okay? That's what making a measurement means. It means you do something that, that creates data in your data stream. So you make a measurement, and the way it's done is that a random draw is taken taken from the probability distribution of the possibilities, and that's what happens. That then becomes the present, and so on. So that's how a probable uh, reality works. Now, you can modify that probability distribution with your intent. So there's a whole bunch of us, and we're going to have a picnic uh, two weekends from now, and it's going to be the whole family on, on the park. And we want it to be a nice day. And if we all have a real strong intent that it's going to be a nice day, the probability of it being a nice day is much greater. If we all are worried that it's going to be rainy and a nasty day, then the probability of it being a nasty day is more probable. You see, So we get to make this world, this future, according to our intents. Now, our, our intent doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, it just changes the probability. You don't force what you want to happen to happen. All you do is change the probability of it happening. So if you had something that was very rare, and maybe it was one in a million, and you really wanted that to happen, so you put a lot of tenant into it, so you change it from one in a million to one in a thousand, well, that's three orders of magnitude. You've changed it by you know a factor of a thousand. Wow, that's a lot of change. But chances are it's still not going to happen because it's one in a thousand, you see. So you don't know that this, this idea that you uh, make your reality. It's not necessarily that you, you just get what you want whenever you want it. It is that you modify the probabilities. Now, so here we are making choices. And let's say, and that's our free will and our entropy. So we make low entropy choices that are loving choices about other people. Well, not about ourselves. It's not our fear. It's our love that's making the choices. Well, when we do that, that loving intent 
modifies the probability for things that are nice, that are loving, that are whatever to happen, because that's our intent. So those kinds of things happen to us. You know, if our intent is the other way, if we have a miserable negative intent, then those things happen to us are tend to be more negative and miserable. It's the power of positive thinking and the power of negative thinking and the power of the placebo effect. All of these things work on the same idea. That's how mental healing works. It's the same way. So intent modifies probability. And if we lower entry or raising entropy, that, you know, modifies our intent. What we do is a reflection of our intent. First, we have an intent and that intent gets expressed in action. And that intent modifies the probability. So you can see they are connected. We are lowering or raising our entropy uh, according to our intent, but our intent creates, helps create the choices that we have and the world that we live in. So they are all connected, oh, but it's uh, not a direct no, sort of I, thing. I, I, I think, think you explained it very well. It's not so much about, but it is a, an it's indirect that way. I'm just sort of uh, pondering the on the, the connection there. Um, there's, a, there's a very old um, school of thought. I think this comes out of uh, the Greek philosopher Empedocles, which said that the, um, basically the more love there was in the universe, the more chaotic the universe was, that chaos was an expression of love, and that control was an expression of fear. Uh, and they saw this as uh, direct, excuse me, directly related. And um, this, you can even see this in, um, uh, in Dante's Inferno, there's an expression where he talks about the the crucifixion, the moment of crucifixion of Christ, this ultimate expression of love, actually sent out this huge ripple of chaos throughout the world. And so whatever, so it's just an idea that's always sort of intrigued me as different philosophers have played with this. So when I hear you sort of talking about the idea of love being expression of reduced entropy, yeah. I'm just sort of yeah. pondering it over in my in my mind. Again, this is this is a language yeah. issue to be sure. But I just sort of wanted to hear you speak to to that concept of. It seems like uh, right. we still have uh, massive amounts of. There are still pe plenty of potentialities yeah. in the world, um, but I, I understand. I understand absolutely where you're taking this. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, didn't understand your question real well. It was my problem. Uh, what's happening that when you talk about the crucifixion and it created a lot of chaos? But that's not the key thing, you know. It's that it is true that that uh, fear uh, feeds control. That's true. It's not true that love feeds chaos. Chaos is there. And in contrast to love, chaos often seems bigger. You know, you notice the chaos next to the love because they, they uh, you know, one kind of would highlight the other. But the thing is that let's just take that crucifixion as the, as the example you gave. What that did is started, let's say it started a religion. It started a spread of a philosophy. And in that philosophy, we have kind of a seminal statement that says God is love. And it spread that, uh, that philosophy in a, in a much wider way you see, than it would have happened otherwise. So yes, there was chaos, but the chaos was already there. The love didn't create the chaos. The point was the chaos was there. And chaos may uh, kind of rear up its ugly head and roar when it sees a challenge, love being the challenge. But the love doesn't create the chaos. The chaos is there. The love combats the chaos. It it does moving toward order, and uh, chaos does sometimes react to it. And uh, you know, like anything, reacts to it. You do uh, you do something that's very loving and caring, and it fixes a lot of things. Well, maybe there's a lot of people don't want things fixed. They like the status quo just the way it is. They're making money off that status quo, and they may get up and roar and create create a lot of chaos that. Uh, 
maybe if they're if they're successful with their chaos, they may have run that sure, and I think it's also a sort of the love didn't create sort of a philosophical chaos. the chaos was there um, the love just different, different philosophical just approaches it up, because you know, right, got it excited there's the to, idea of things being ordered so love, you know the in one respect an ultimate expression of an ordered universe could be you know uh, Mussolini's Italy you know there's this sort of joke right you know you can make the trains run on time that could be a very ordered system but it's certainly not a particularly loving system and again, it's, it's just sort of, um, these are mental exercises. I'm not trying to, to paint any, um, you know, I'm, yeah. No, no, it's, they're good. They're, they're good. Yeah, they're real good exercises because they help us define terms and what we mean by the terms. You see, they're, so they are very good. Well, yes, you can, you can talk about Mussolini and his trains or Hitler or something. Hitler created a lot of order because now everybody, you know, marched together in goose step and you know that was order and uh, everybody was going to come under one leader and that's order that is that is the changing the entropy in the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm, okay. physical world right we're talking about lowering the entropy changing the entropy within consciousness two different systems altogether you see so most of Blaney may have forced those trains to run on time because he shot a few people who were, you know, part of the problem, and that wasn't in the loving system. And he did lower the entropy in the system where, tra you know, in the transportation system, let's say, because now it was more orderly. But at the same time, he was creating creating huge amounts of entropy as he did that because shooting people that you believe are part of the problem cre creates. A lot of randomness creates, you know, it raises entropy. That's divisive. It doesn't make people, you know, pull together and work together. It makes people frightened. So what he did had a local effect of lowering entropy and also a local effect of raising entropy. But that has only to do with the physical world, with this virtual world and what's going on there. I would say that he raised entropy more than he lowered it. <laughs> right. He raised a whole lot of entropy and he reduced little bits and pieces of it. The train running was not a really big thing in the world, and and as part of what he did, you know, uh, his 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 place in World War, you know, World War Two, that was a much, much bigger thing of what he did. So he raised a lot of entropy and uh, lowered it in this spot or, or that spot. So if we look at the total, you know, Mussolini should not be known as a lower of entropy. You see, that would be just singling out a, a single thing. But again. That's all physical world. And in the world of consciousness, we evolve the quality of our consciousness by lowering our entropy and de-evolve by raising it. Now, in the physical world, it's similar. It's not the physical world is totally different, but it's a different system, right? And entropy raises and lowers within a system. So entropy is very system-specific. But in general, in the world, we are all better off the world progresses, and we are in a in a uh, higher state of being in our physical world if the entropy is lowered. So we have a Hitler and a Mussolini who, who raised the entropy, you know, a hundred or a thousand times more than they lowered it. But the net effect was raising the entropy. Not good. Had Hitler and and Mussolini and, and uh, Tojo, I guess. Uh, decided instead that they would take those resources and, uh, you know, house, house the people without housing and feed the poor, you know, that would have uh, lowered entropy and we all would have been better off. That would have made everything work better. Instead, they decided to, you know, take land and uh, run over uh, the people who, with free will who disagreed with them and so on. So even in our, in, in our uh, physical world, lowering entropy is a good thing. Now, lowering entropy, if at the same time you raise entropy, you know, an act can do both. There may be an action that you could take that would lower entropy some and raise entropy some. If it mostly lowers entropy, it's mostly a good thing. If it mostly raises en entropy, it's mostly a bad Absolutely, thing. Yeah. But everything isn't black and white. You know, there are things that have some good in them and have some bad in them. And entropy is a good way to sort that out. Uh yeah, you know, yeah, no, that was excellent. A lot of really good points. Um, you know, we don't want to keep you too long, so whenever you feel like you have to go, please let us know. Uh, I would like 
to ask you another question though <clears throat> and then as you're long as, as long as it's productive and we're doing things that you find interesting and useful then then that's what I'm all about so we'll just keep going until uh, either everybody's tired or or um, it's not useful anymore we're <laughs> competing ourselves so <laughs> all right yeah I'm the uh, yeah for me, I mean, like another 30 minutes would be ideal, but I mean, if you guys want to hang on, whatever. Um, but I guess uh, to kind of go off on another tangent, reincarnation, past lives, that kind of thing, and how the, to tie that into NDE. Do you have any insights into that? Is this a, more theoretical for you in terms of your interest in it or, or um, from some of your uh, out-of-body or, or other kinds of uh, practices applications. Do you have any insights into that? Do you think that sure. is a feasible thing that's going on? Sure. Well, in my system and my you know, the MBT theory, if you will, um, reincarnation, uh, which I don't call reincarnation, I just call uh, you know, an experience packet. We have uh, units of uh, consciousness that have experiences and they come in packets, which then we would say the packet is a lifetime some virtual reality. All, all experience happens in virtual realities. Uh, if you're not in a virtual reality, then you're not having experience. A virtual reality is a reality with a rule set. Without a rule set, there's no interaction defined. There's no ways to interact or connect with no rule set. You need, a, you need rules to define the game. So even if you have a reality where you can do nothing but trade information, let's say a chat room, there still needs to be a rule set. You have to have rules that define the protocols for the language, for the exchange of information. How do you exchange that information? What does that information mean? What are the symbols? All that is, is rules. So you need a virtual reality to have experience. So there are all kinds of virtual realities. You know, Our virtual reality, we call our physical universe, is just one among many virtual realities. And they all aren't, uh, they all don't have such uh, uh, strict rules sets as the physical virtual realities do, like our universe. That's a much stricter rule set. You can have rule sets that aren't so strict and have different kinds of virtual reality, like your dream state. Your dreaming reality is another virtual reality. So we have that. Now, um, the theory requires reincarnation. It's a logical part of the process. The theory won't work if you don't have reincarnation because, like I say, that's, a, that's, a, that's a one of the logical processes that's required in the overall theory. It's a, it's a uh, have to have. And the reason is, is that the whole point of us in this virtual reality as consciousness, having these experiences, making choices, and raising and lowering our entropy, you know, evolving or de-evolving, okay, that whole, uh, let me see where's I going with this, um, Yeah, yeah. The whole the whole point of that, right, is to, is to grow up, is to change, is to learn. So if you're lear learning and growing up, that means you were one way and you're 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 now a different way. That doesn't work well if you do it all in parallel. Learning is a serial thing. That's why they don't try to teach us calculus in kindergarten. You see, learning doesn't work. You don't get it all at once. You have to take it in pieces. You do everything that you can learn in step one, and that enables you to learn more in step two, which enables you to learn more in step three. Learning tends to be serial. So growing up is a serial process. Now, we could parallel process it. We could, say, have 10 and reincarnations going at the same time. So we have ten, our, our consciousness is split in 10 ways. Each one has an avatar and each one is learning. But now those 10 aren't able to take advantage of the things that will be learned in each lifetime. You see, it's like it, they're all done at the same level. So if where you were was in third grade, then you have 10 third graders that are all, all in the third grade. And they will come back and pool all their experiences in a third grade, and that will be your third grade experiences, and that took 10. That was a parallel processing. Or you can just do third grade just once, one, uh, individ you know, one individuated unit of consciousness, and then you can come back and add that experience you know, to the whole. And then you can go do fourth grade, and then you can go do fifth grade. So the whole gets the benefit of integrating your experience. Integrating a whole bunch of experience that's all about the same is, is not that efficient way to do it. 
Now, the way the system works is that most of your incarnations are going to be serial. Okay, you're going to uh, go one at a time because that way you have cumulative learning. But you may have a special situation where two at a time would be very instructive. Like you may be both father and son, and you may be both of those. Now you get two perspectives on the same thing, which could be valuable to you. So you can parallel process, but you need to be able to, to uh, have a string of experience packets. Even if you did them 10 at a time, you need to do 10, and then you'd need to do another 10, and then you'd need to do another 10. That would just be inefficient as it is to take one or one or two, and then another one or two, and another one or two. That's a more efficient use of the resources to create a learning situation. So you have to learn cumulative. If it's a one shot and it's not a, a series of, of uh, experience packets, then it's like, okay, you're in first grade, now learn everything. Okay, everything from alphabet to uh, you know, advanced uh, calculus, we're going to do it all this one year. Well, you know, that wouldn't work because you have to start at the beginning and build your, your logical process. Just putting that together, your understanding has to come in pieces because you can't understand C until you understand B. You can't understand you know, things until you're ready. So it takes many lifetimes to grow up. It's not just do it all now. Becoming love is a tough thing. Getting rid of all the fear and ego is a tough thing. And it's not like, well, you got one shot. You need to do it all, all right now. You know, Become love. It's not going to happen. It's too... All these changes have to occur at the being level. It's not an intellectual process. You don't become love because you can think all loving thoughts. You have to be loving, not think about it, but be it. The being is a slow, difficult. That's an evolutionary process to become someone different. So that's why you have to have uh, uh, a reincarnation, multiple lives, because otherwise the system wouldn't work. The virtual reality would not be useful. Uh, the whole system just is, uh, you know, wouldn't work if you didn't have that. So that's a necessary part of the system. And in my experiences in the larger consciousness system, I indeed many times has fo have followed that process along. I've been with somebody while they were dying. And as they, you know, when they die. I was with them in that experience, and I was still with them during the transition and with them right up until they decided to uh, go back into another being, and I could be with them then. And in other words, you can follow the transition all along. It's all a continuous process. And ha having done that numbers of times, I know that you know that's the way it is from an experiential viewpoint. But from a logical viewpoint, it has to be that way or growth would be impossible. If growth is impossible, then what's the point of a virtual reality to help people grow? And what's the point of breaking into multiple pieces that interact with each other for growth? And the whole system breaks down and no longer makes any sense. So the way you build up a model is you configure the model so that it explains the data, in other words, so that it makes sense. Well, reincarnation is a, is a necessary logical component of a model that makes sense of all the data. Not only do you have NDEs and, and uh, you know, people who, uh, you know, you have, what, uh, five and six-year-old children that'll tell you all about the plane they flew in World War I or something, and you get enough facts that you actually can verify there was such a person in such a plane. And there's lots of data that is out there in the world that if you're going to fit all the data, then... Um, and if you're going to fit our purpose and what we're doing here and the nature of reality, then reincarnation is just a necessary logical component. Otherwise, you don't fit all the data. You may make materialists happy, but you don't fit the data. And I've, I, I have confidence in the data that I have experienced. And I can, watch, I can look at data that other people discuss and talk about, and I have a pretty good idea whether that data is, is real data or something they thought of because I've been there and done that and seen it and I know how it works. So the, you know, I can, I'm a pretty, uh, shall I say, I have a lot of experience in 
judging the value of data, whether it sounds like it could indeed have happened that way or whether it sounds like indeed it couldn't. So I see lots of data that needs to be fit there on that subject, and my theory fits it by including uh, data packets that you do serially because you have to evolve and evolution is a slow, long process that's cumulative. Evolution doesn't happen all the day. You can't take all the critters and start with an amoeba and say, all right, by sundown, you know, we're going to have the whole thing done. It just doesn't work that way. And, and evolving consciousness is like that, too. It takes lots of iterations. Thanks. Tom, I was wondering, um, we are more and more building a vir virtual reality you know um, at, at, um, at some point we could get lost in the virtual reality we are uh, constructing uh, with computers and things like that um, w what is the ultimate point of uh, lowering our entropy uh, should we become light at, at some point or do you, do you understand what I mean Should we become light? No, I mean, if we lower our entropy more and more and more, what, what, what could be the ultimate state of that system? The, do you want to know the, uh, the, the in-between states or the final state? Where are we going? The, the, the final states. Uh, what's the purpose and what, what, okay. what would be the future and the final state of uh, such okay. a... Okay. First of all, simulation. you have to understand that... the. The, um, well, what can we say? Uh, it's not a closed system, okay? If we had just N numbers of consciousness, okay? There is just exactly, you know, 10 billion individuated units of consciousness that exist and seven and a half billion of them are right here and, and, and eventually all 10 will be here and that's it on this planet and, and that's all the consciousness there is. Then eventually... You figure that the whole thing, the whole group will grow up and, and become love and have lower entropy and lower entropy and lower entropy. And then they'll get to some point where they're just, everybody's done. You know, the entropy is really, really low. And what's the point anymore? So we'll all sit on clouds and play harps and things like that because we will have uh, all grown. Well, it's not a closed system. There's always new coming in. It's just like all the students that are in school right now. That's not all the students there are. When the ones graduate out of, out of kindergarten going to first grade, another whole set comes in to kindergarten because um, it's not a closed system. There's always new kids being generated that have to end up in kindergarten. So our system's like that too. So one, it's not a closed system. Everybody's not going to end up uh, at lower entropy state. Secondly, this thing about lowering your entropy is a, is a, a thing in process that really you never get to the end of it. There's not a point where everybody gets to zero entropy, so, so uh, that's the end of the game. This is an evolutionary process. Evolution keeps going. Evolution is, an, let's say, an open-ended process. Evolution doesn't stop. It gets to a point, and from that point on, it evolves into the possibilities, and then it, goes, it picks certain possibilities over others and at that point it evolves into the possibilities unless you get to a point where there are no more possibilities then the system is stalled out but that is an unlikely process when you've got billions of things interacting with each other that you get to a point there are no, are no more choices you see so the way we the way we evolve as a, as a group talking about conscious entities the way we evolve as a group is by making the effort, by changing, by taking a, a, a higher consciousness, a higher, uh, let me not say higher consciousness, but a higher amount of entropy, a um, lower quality of consciousness and evolving it forward, right? That's how we do that. And that takes effort. So the system can't say, well, look, here's, a, here's some low consciousness beings. These are really, really low entropy beings, some... some uh, Low, some high quality of consciousness. I'm getting my words mixed up here. I'm talking too fast. But anyway, we have uh, high quality individuals, high quality of consciousness, uh, 
low entropy. So why don't I just duplicate all of those? Why don't I just delete all, all the ones that aren't at that level and duplicate all the ones that are, and then we'd be done. There's no value in that. You see, there's no evolution in that. Evolution is growth and change. All that does is you basically duplicated, duplicated um, what you had. You're still no further along in what you had. It's the same thing. You write a book, okay? And writing a book, you lower entropy. You take your thoughts, your ideas, your feelings, you put them in this nice structured language and whatever. You've lowered entropy. Now, if you just take that book and make a thousand copies, does that lower entropy a thousand times more? No, all it does is leave you right where you were. It just gives you, you know, more stuff. That'd be like evolution. Uh, okay, you finally evolved to, a, you know, you had... Uh, you had tiny little things, you had amoebas, you had this, you had eventually you got all the way up to a goldfish. Well, I know, let's just duplicate and fill the whole world full of goldfish and then we're done. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You see, evolution is a process of growth, not of copy and paste. You don't evolve by copy and pasting. You evolve by changing what you are into something else. So, one, as I said, it's not a closed system. There's new conscious entities coming into the system all the time and two it's not about the the um, the entropy the, the entropy of the whole is indeed lowering but that's not the goal that that's where we get to I'll see I'm getting confusing it is the goal of evolution but you don't jump there by, by copying so it's a goal you continually work at and like ev like all evolution you never actually reach a goal. We're not at the end of, say, human evolution. You know, 100,000 years from now, humans will probably be very different than they are now. And 100,000 years ago, they were different than they are now. And, you know, 2 million years ago, they're very different than they are now. So, it's, it's change is the key. So, we're never done. Now, let's look at the, at the ego and the love part of this. So... I run into people all the time that say, man, I can't wait till this is over because, you know, I don't have any fear and I don't have an ego. And when I'm done with this one, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back to this hellhole anymore. This place sucks. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. The reason that this, that they feel no, no joy and a lot of frustration is because they're full of fear and full of ego. That's one thing. Okay. The second thing is, this idea of, I'm out of here, I'm tired of this, I don't want to do this, all those things start with I. It's I, I, I. It's all about them. This is not exactly the being of love that's talking. If you grow up enough that you're not really learning a whole lot coming back here because you've already lowered your entropy enough that uh, this game isn't that challenging anymore, well, you get new challenges. It's not just about you. It's about others. You come here to teach. You come here to be a good example. You come here to help others lower their entropy, grow the quality of their consciousness, you see. And when are you done with that? Well, new consciousness is coming in at the bottom all the time. You're never done with it. So the people who say, I'm out of here, I'm never coming back, I don't want to be involved with this mess, that's just ego talking. These are people who need to come back into this mess because they're really not doing too well because they're very self-focused and self-centered and it's all about them not wanting to have to deal with this mess. So you see, the idea that somewhere we get out, we get issued a harp and have to sit on a cloud and play it for the rest of eternity, that doesn't ever happen. You know, I'm just, that's a metaphor, right? Uh, that just doesn't happen. Uh, there's always something to do. There's always something to give, somebody to help, a role to play in the overall evolution of consciousness. And you can play roles in other reality frames other than this virtual reality. There's lots of other virtual realities at various states that you can also play in, different games that will challenge you. So that's the, you know, that's kind of the idea is that um, you get to a point where you feel like you're not learning much, well, probably that's your ego talking. If it's not your ego talking, and that's true, there's pl plenty of people need your help. So there is no end. We keep working, helping, growing, becoming, improving our quality, and it's just like trying to make entropy go to zero here in the physical 
world. It's impossible. You can't get to zero. You can only get asymptotic to zero. Okay, but you never quite get there because there's never an end because this is an open process. The larger conscious system itself is changing. It's evolving. It's growing. It's not going to be like it is now, you know, a billion years from now. It'll be something different. It wasn't like it is now a billion years ago. It's a growing, it's a real system. It's trying to survive by keeping its entropy low, by working. Because you see, if you don't work at it, if you're not constantly growing, what happens? Entropy starts oh, yeah. to go up. If you stop working and stop learning and stop growing, you immediately start to dissipate, disintegrate, degenerate. The only thing that keeps entropy from increasing is your effort. If the larger consciousness system said, oh, oh, all right, we're pretty good here. We got a lot of low interest. Let's just quit. That would be the beginning of it all unraveling and entropy would start to grow. Okay, What was loving would start to have ego creeping back in it, would start to uh, click up into the good guys and the not so good guys, would start to degenerate. The only thing that keeps it move, moving forward is effort, challenge, meeting that challenge uh, with, with, with choices, free will choices. So there really is no uh, practical end to it. <laughs> we're part of this larger system, and uh, we're part of its strategy for evolving, well, and I just, suspect we just will not run the, out of that job. That's, a, that's a, a lifetime job ends, when your lifetime like this conversation is forever. Never ends. This is <laughs> okay, thanks. still so many things to explore and so much that I would like to uh, pick your brain about. I'm, I would absolutely love to have you back on again at some point in the future <laughs> if you'd be up for it. Um, this was really a real pleasure. Uh, but uh, if you would be so kind, before we let you go, for listeners, remind them uh, your website, where they can find more of your work, and uh, hopefully people can kind of start start looking into all that if they haven't done so already, because it's I've been really impressed by your work for the last few years. I've been very very impressed. Okay, sure, I'd be glad to uh, leave a calling card. Uh, uh, you can find my. My stuff by going to Google and putting in Thomas Campbell or by putting in my big toe. And what you will find is a website. Uh, actually, you'll find several websites, but uh, one of the websites you'll find will be mine, which is www.mybigtoe.com. All the, all the letters run together as usual. Um, that that website will have about the books, about me. Um, it'll have some some synopsis of the books, and it'll have uh, all the slides for my presentations and that kind of thing. Um, just kind of go around in it. It also has a forum attached to it. The forum has tens of th thousands of questions answered, and uh, it has some some uh, uh, moderators who are very good at answering questions. And I'm on and off of it, but um, you know. I have a lot of other things to do and a lot of other uh, email to get, get and questions to answer. So I don't answer all the questions, but I, I do come to it uh, probably once, twice a week. I'm there and answering some questions, that sort of thing. So go to the forum. It's a very good place to get your questions answered. There's some smart people there. Besides that, you will find uh, MBT events. MBT is in my big toe, www.mbtevents.com. That's a website that uh, is run by uh, Keith and Donna Warner, and they are my organizers. So they're the ones that uh, organize me to go speak someplace or do a workshop someplace. They do all the work. All I do is do what I'm told, stand up and talk, and then sit down. They uh, do all, all the work and take all the risk. So that's a good website. They have a lot of interesting things there. If you go there, look up a... Uh, Click on, I think it's called uh, Good Stuff or Free Stuff, and scroll around and that you'll find a lot of very interesting uh, things in a, in a group of things called uh, Gems from the Forum. And these were a few things that they picked specially out of the forum that they thought were particularly pertinent, like um, an introduction or an orientation to virtual reality, an orientation. 
orientation to virtual reality uh, to uh, the larger consciousness system. These sorts of things that are kind of uh, basic. What is the larger consciousness system, and what are its attributes, and how is it to go there, and what do you you know what do you get, and what do you don't get, and what how do you tell which is real and what isn't, and et cetera. It's just basic things like that. So there's whole lots of things there. The last thing that I'll mention is YouTube. I've got about 120 videos on YouTube, which are all of my uh, workshops, interviews, um, anything I do that I can get the video or a good link to the video, I put there. So there's lots and lots of things. The one that's probably the best summary still right now is a Calgary workshop. Three days, Friday and introduction, Saturday all the theory, how it works, why it hurt why it works, what it means, and then uh, Sunday uh, applications. So that would be a good place to go. My books, which you can buy at my website, of course, you can also buy on Amazon or, or in your local neighborhood bookstore. They, if they don't have them, they can order them. But you don't have to buy them. I have them free on Google Books. So if you go to Google Books, you will find their separate books, book one, book two, and book three, on Google Books, and if you can stand to read a book on a computer monitor, then there they are. You don't have to buy them. The only downside to that, besides reading it at the computer monitor, is it's the first book. I put that on there immediately when I published the books. So it went on very early. Since then, the books have been updated every time they've been printed, which is like four or five times. And the updates altogether probably don't amount to 5%, but there are a little things that were confusing that people complained about that I made less confusing and some material that I added but you know it's it's more like a, a paragraph here and a paragraph there and maybe a couple of thousand uh, type of those and, and uh, wording making the wording better improving the English so uh, it's it's free though and it's probably a 98% uh, of what you'd get if if you've got something recent. So that's it. That's where you can get all my stuff. And, uh, oh, I also have a, a, a Facebook presence. I don't know how you find me on Facebook. I guess you could put my name in, but Tom Campbell isn't exactly a rare name. So uh, anyway, Facebook uh, uh, is there. And there's lots of other things going on too. There's a couple of Facebook sites that are not mine, but are still about my big toe. And there's uh, alternative uh, forums as well where people have decided to start their own. And, and uh, there's lots of stuff going on. You just have to take a little, a little time to uh, find it on the web. So that's it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks a lot for coming in and speaking oh, to us. We really appreciate it. See you next time. I don't know what time, time it is time. in France see, right now, but thank you. See you next time, guys. Thank you for uh, giving me the uh, invitation. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot.